numbers. Hey, Cleveland Moto Podcast number 482. Light them up, boys. Oh, oh, Los Gates. All right. Nice. And to my immediate left tonight, we have... Dan Kropke. And to his left... Steve Sleepy. And to his left... Johnny Mac. To his left... Speedy Pete. And to his left... Chris Smith. And behind the bar... Tom Pennington. What a crew. I mean, we got it all. Full house again. Full house, man. This is it. No empty chairs. I love it. Uh, This is episode 482. I wanted to remind people what a big deal that is. That's fantastic. Uh, Been doing this. We posted another one from the crypt... This morning, one of the ones from the vault, because last week I was out of town, so we got to throw an old one on the fire. And that was fun, getting to listen to the old voices and, you know, everything that we were up to at that particular time. And uh, just made me, you know, just a great reminder for uh, how much fun it is, how long we've been doing it. So long, so very long. And uh, it's it's cool. We uh, had a a death in the industry uh, two days ago. Uh, One of our mentors, one of the people that brought us uh, great joy, and you might not realize it until I say it, but the man who invented Genuine Scooter Company, the guy that created the Buddy Scooter, the guy who created the Stella Scooter, um, the guy that brought us all that joy, uh, Phil McCaleb, uh, the guy who invented Scooter Works and kept us all in parts after Vespa left America. Uh, Phil McCaleb had a massive, massive coronary on Wednesday morning. Um, He died, and he was really... He was getting into the third stage of his life. Um, he'd, he'd been drummed out of Genuine Scooter Company, the company that he invented in a hostile takeover. And he needed to get some outside help. He needed some financial money in there. And he got, a, you know, he found an investment group to come in and help. And that investment group really did fuck him over. And they saw him as being the principal force behind the thing. And they managed to they managed to railroad him out of his own company. And it is a great tragedy. It is a massive tragedy, but he recovered from that and he was living a great life. He had a girlfriend. He had a, he was building a house up in uh, Minnesota, right next to our friend, Bob Hedstrom's uh, home. They were really, he was really doing some great stuff and he had a happy thing. I'm happy that he called me two weeks before he died as he would do sometimes and he called just to see how we were doing. Wait, he just called. He called you two weeks before he died several weeks. several times. No, no. It, <laughs> well, he would. He was this guy. He would send you a postcard out of nowhere. Right. Right. He'd just give you occasional call to touch base and see how everything was going. When he would hold his dealer meetings, when he would hold his trainings, he really made it a family thing. When he started the whole Stella project and everything about it was to be better. He wanted to give the product uh, a personality. He want all of his advertising was always very much cool. It wasn't like obscure weird art shit. It was very fun. It was I, like you get I one design of these, Italian for right. it. Yeah. Yeah, it's, it was very fun. And the buddy <clears throat> things from the buddy, remember that the buddy's first thing was the buddy scooter. It starts with a hug. That's fucking great, right? Um you know, have you, you know, ha, you know, have you kissed your buddy today? Kind of thing. Like mm-hmm. it was all real positive. It was, it was, yeah, it was all really joyful. <laughs> and so to have that guy gone now that, you know, that, that creates a void. That's the number of people that are friends of all of our friends. Mm-hmm. Like everybody we know yeah. has touch, has rubbed elbows with him Absolutely. somewhere. He was not a hands off corporate guy. No. He'd go to all the scooter rallies. He'd show up, he'd give you a little, Hey, like, check this out. And he made deals with the Ferrara Pan Candy Company. So there was an Atomics Fireball, the Atomic, Atomic Fireball, Fireball. Yep. limited edition Stella scooter that was yep. covered with all the art from the Candy Company. There was a Lemonheads Buddy scooter yep. that was all the art from the Lemonheads Candy. <laughs> the Black Cat. The Black Cat. He actually <laughs> went to the Black Cat Fireworks that was Company hysterical. and got branding on a yep. scooter. And it said light fuse and run away. Yep. You know, my uh, uh, use with adult supervision only. My rat, my rat TNG Milano out in the garage. It has a light, light fuse fuse and run away. away, uh, Front uh, from uh, fender. So, you know, that guy really did bring a lot of creative joy to the thing. Um, I will just, for the sake of the people who are listening to the podcast, when I started my business and I wanted to become more than just a guy working on scooters in my garage. I had bought thousands and thousands of dollars worth of parts from Scooter Works. And when I said I was starting a business and that I would have to be moved from a normal consumer account into a corporate account, so I would get a discount, right? He vetted me 
to the point where I had to show up at his place in Chicago. And he's like, what am I going to do? You know, you're just some skinhead working on bikes in his garage thing, right? You know, why, why, why should I give you a discount? Why should I help you out? You know, like, what are you going to do for me? Like, I'm selling you parts now. Why would I ever give you a discount? Well, because I'm a real shop and I'm going to exist and it's going to be a real thing. And we went from that very difficult conversation to when I was at Supersonic ordering a ton of parts from his company with our well fucking earned discount on our $5,000 first order, which a $5,000 first order when we were getting started was more than we could handle. And then to be less than two years later, I was one of his top dealers in America selling the Stella scooter and putting his face here. Remember, we sold Stella scooter number one in Cleveland, Ohio. The very first ever Stella ever sold happened in my shop. And we were proud of that. And he also was proud of us. And he let us know it. When he was having trouble with the company in in Taiwan, PGO, when he was having trouble with them, they wanted, they didn't want him to sell their PGO boo-boo scooter. They wanted to sell their PGO boo-boo scooter. And they didn't think they needed to film a Caleb. They thought they could do it themselves like Kimco did. They, Kimco muscled STR Power Sports out of the way so Kimco could have Kimco USA. When the Taiwanese were giving him shit, he bought them all plane tickets. And he brought the, the C-suite from PGO in Taiwan. He brought them to America. And he toured them around to his dealers and basically showed them how difficult we are to manage and that they need a Phil McCaleb. Because these American guys aren't like the Taiwan guys that are going to order 500 scooters every month. They need a Phil McCaleb because there's a Phil Waters. Well, that's <laughs> well, absolutely, yeah. absolutely true. true. <laughs> and I believe he took them to five dealers. And so they could see how important that <clears throat> he was to maintaining these very small volume dealers when they're used to thinking about scooters in like 20,000, 30,000 units. We're thinking about bikes eight at a time, 12 at a time. You need somebody to manage that. You need somebody to keep those people motivated and to keep them selling your stuff because a one big dog doesn't weigh more than a bunch of little dogs. And McCaleb knew that he had a bunch of little dogs, but if he could get them all pulling together, we could do anything. And we did. And it was because of his motivation and it was because of his creativity I know that all of us that do scooters, we have a Scooter Works catalog in our house somewhere. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and that Scooter Works catalog was a work of art. It was a magazine that we looked forward to. Yep. Because it gave you insights and information. It gave you guides into, hey, look, I got a Vespa here from I don't know when. Well, there's a list in there that tells you based on serial number what year and model that bike is and the traps to look forward to to make sure you do order the right parts. It was really something. So that little catalog wasn't just a catalog to take your money. It was a wealth of information. And he made sure of that. And he had great people working for him. And I know he wasn't easy to work with all the time. My, my friends who worked with him will be happy to tell you that. But we really did learn how to work with each other. And as much as I really didn't like him very much when we started, he became one of my absolute best mentors and also, when I would have an idea and say, hey, I think we should do something like this, he took the idea for the blackjack, the buddy oh, yeah. blackjack, right from a scooter shop, right from one of us, and built a bike on it and sold a bunch of them. That's one of the big thing that's been, things that has been missing mm -hmm. lately in the, in the industry at a whole yes, are special editions. Special editions designed for a market that exists, yeah. designed to get people's attention. He really did that well. Yeah. He, he nailed that. And so, you know, you even know, the even the GB the GB one fifty exactly you know, perfectly the oddball, good example right. little things that he would do, and it would be, oh yeah, I'm gonna run, we're gonna do a run of we're gonna do 144 of these bikes and and put know, a number plate on them. Yeah, was, say was, it's was, a was, limited was, edition. Was he behind the uh, Justin Bieber? Vespa? He was not. No, he was not. <laughs> and by the way, that's the best example ever. But the different Phil McCaleb would have never done. That. Oh no, I'm, yeah. I'm making well, just fail. No. Pia, Pia, to their credit, Piaggio keeps trying to tap into the the artistic model, which is why we get crazy things like yeah. The, the, but McCaleb actually every time yeah. he'd produce a special edition, all those all those buddy oh, yeah. scooters that are the international editions, 
Yep. That was all him. Yep. The fact that there's a buddy Italian and it has a horn that will blow the dirt off a bum at 50 paces. <laughs> you know, he put a stable Nautilus air horn, like a boat horn, on a on a scooter. You know, that was that's that's the thing. Is you got the Italia and the Hispanic what was the Hispanic the red one? Yeah, the San the the, the San Pamplona. Trope and the, the Pamplona. Pamplona. And, and he and made, had the little G the little blue and white one that I love. That's the San Trope. No, the G B the G B one. Oh yeah, the, the Brit. Yeah. The Brit one. The Brit. He did all these and then he made artwork to go yep. along with it. So there are big posters and all kinds of cool shit. So he never forgot that not only do we want the people to have the bike and feel special, but then we want to have little cute toys about it yep. and all kinds of fun stuff to enhance your experience of owning such a fun, cool thing at half the price of a Vespa. Yep. So you could have half the price of a Vespa, but have this whole world that you were a part of instantly. I, I still say this is the giant, the biggest F you to Piaggio over that whole deal. And it was, and he did. He was all set up to be the next, he was set up to be the U.S. distributor for Piaggio and that didn't go well. And they didn't want him. They wanted to do it their own way and they did wrong. And he proved them wrong because yep. he stole their lunch for a long time. Yep. And that Stella, when, <laughs> when the Stella came out, if you want to know how important that guy was, he brought a Stella out in 2002 that was a two-stroke and he fought the laws and got the laws to bend to allow two-stroke in this country. That Stella was out for three solid years before, for, before Piaggio Vespa went back and said, I think we need to bring some PX-150s to America. <laughs> and they did. And they hung their ass out bringing PX-150s to America. They did EPA testing and all these kind of shit. And they never sold nearly the number that the Stella did. And there were way more Stella happy customers than there were Vespa PX-150 happy yep. customers. Yep. Yep. And he nailed that. He did that. He did that very well. And Piaggio it, made a huge mistake by not immediately hiring him the day they came oh, yeah. back to America in 2002. Well, that Juris filled me in on a little bit of that, that he was he was all signed up. And then somebody in Italy, Piaggio, like, poof, disappeared. Yeah, and the next they, guy, yeah. like, there's a whole story back yeah, there. There's a whole thing about it. And, and he had a very was, good. That's the big tragedy for Piaggio yeah. USA. They could have had, from day one, they could have had a, a mailing list with the 10,000 people in America that already owned their products. And they didn't. And he had it. And he knew it. And he leaned into it. And he paid a lot of lawyers. And he lost a lot of money. But he, he, he did, he was to himself true. And he had a vision. And he never stepped away from it. So... <laughs> Phil McCaleb, wherever you are right now, we miss you, buddy. Well done. Cheers. Um, I know I've been been getting phone calls from dealers all across America (laughs) for the past two days, and we're all telling our Phil McCaleb stories about how great he was, Mm. even though he pissed us off to no end. Oh, God, yeah. Sometimes the great ones do that, though. That's how they got where they're at, right? Hey, look, man, if you don't push me, I'm not going to perform for you. (laughs) And he knew how to push. Yep. And sometimes sometimes he pissed you off, but... I never threw him out of my shop. I always was happy to have him there. And he was always a class act, even though he's wearing a velour shirt from 1986. <laughs> uh, he was still a class act. And he, he always knew how to take care of his dealers and take care of his people. It was pretty rad. Mm. So, yeah, that's, that was a thing. And that hit us. That hit our industry pretty heavy. Yep. Well, speaking of losing Phil's, Phil Lesh died today. What? No oh, more yeah. bass player no from more? the Grateful Dead. Right. Yeah. Oh, man. They're down to two. They're down to two original <laughs> members, yeah, huh? Yeah. No, two oh. bass players. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, no. Yeah, no. Um, a little uh, a bright note. You guys might remember a while ago, I got this little silly Sportster. I, I got this 2002 Sportster 1200. Philly Sportster. Philly Sportster. <laughs> that was good. I yeah. love that thing. And I got it on a sore dick deal, a trade in. Guy was an old man that wanted to get away from the Harley and get into a Vespa. And it kind of sat around my shop. James rode it for a while. We put new rubber on it, changed the handlebars away, got some decent looking handlebars on it. I have been spending the past two weeks riding this motorcycle. Hmm. And I have got to tell you, it's a good motorcycle. Right. It has a carburetor. I only keep ethanol free gas in it. Right. Been riding it around. It does everything exactly like you want it to do. It's it's a fun bike to ride. It makes it's just got the stock exhaust on, but it still sounds good. It sounds nice. 
It drives exactly like you want it to. It's got all the torque in all the right places. It's not too fucking heavy. And that one's not visually offensive. I was going to say, it's not too horribly ugly either. Right? <laughs> you know, that, you know <laughs> it's not too horribly ugly. To, yeah. to, to, a non-hurly, to a non-hurly guy, which I am, Right. that is the <laughs> quintessential ugly. ugly. <laughs> it is the quintessential Harley with that big right. giant oval air filter. Yeah. yeah, it does have the old it school is, 1200. It is the perfect lines for a Harley sports I mean, that is the most unfucked sports I've ever <laughs> oh, seen. Absolutely. <laughs> <It is>. Absolutely. <laughs> I don't see one eagle on it. Nope. No, there's no smashed eagles <laughs> on it anywhere. No eagles. <laughs> As Johnny Chrome would say, there's no smashed chickens on if this you, bike. <laughs> if, you, if you put an AMF logo on the side of that, it would look like an AMF sports yeah. car. I mean, that is that is the quintessential Harley right there. Yeah, I, that I big like dog dish air, co- air yep. cleaner off the old uh, FLHs. Spoke Looks good. wheels. I like the spoke oh, wheels. Yeah. It's a nice yeah. bike and it's it runs a, around great. It's a pretty bike. Is it a four speed or five? Five, five speed. I wouldn't use the word pretty. pretty. Well, well, well. <laughs> you, know, you know, I have I have learned to respect that design over the even as much crap as I give Harleys. I've learned that right there to yeah. me is is the perfect Harley. So I, with the cross pipe on the exhaust, does it does it take away from the potato? Or no, it no? still has potato. Okay. Yeah. But more importantly, though, it, but it, it also still has the baffles. So it it's still not has the baffles. No, it's it's more, more of a mesh potato. Right. Yeah. 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 It doesn't it doesn't sound like you're farting on a toilet. So it's a you know what it's. It's, it's a really good bike, and I, I just have to say that why we're talking about this is in today's market, this motorcycle has got about 3,200 miles on it. That's nothing. Uh-uh. Yeah. It's nothing, right? 3,200 miles on it. And in today's market, I'm priced high at $4,500. Yep. What'd that bike cost new? Probably seventy six seventy six ninety nine out the door with all the eagles twelve thousand and five hundred. Well, I mean, that's not what this is, right? <laughs> yeah, right. So, uh, yeah. So this bike is, you know, I and I did write in the I said this is Chinese scooter money. Yeah, yeah. And you're getting a true oh, yeah. American. This is a, this is American. Yeah, as you, you can get, can't, by the way. you can't buy a Kimco four hundred for that. Well, it looks better than the um, <laughs> BMW R twelve hundred C. And I'm a BMW guy, right? Yeah. I know. Yeah. And so last night, uh, or night before last, I had a customer bring their bike over for winter storage. Right. So he brings the bike over, and it's one of those Triumph twelve hundred, um, Speedmasters. Yeah. Okay, so it's got the bobber gas tank. It's got the solo saddle looking thing. And it's desperately trying to win the Harley Davidson Sportster lookalike contest. Okay, and it's got a parallel twin fuel injected 1200 motor. Same number of cc's as this. And I promise you, riding that bike two nights ago, getting it over to the warehouse, taking it for a, a rip on the highway, that that bike is smoother. The power delivery is spot on because the fuel injection is just perfect. But it does not feel as good as this bike does. It does not. It, 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 it's, it, it feels more like when we used to tease that, that Honda 1100, um, the CB 1100. We teased it because it just didn't have any soul. It didn't have any motorcycle. It's hollow. It was hollow. It was hollow. And that's when I rode the considerably newer, you know, four-year-old Triumph Speedmaster 1200, when I rode that even at 90 miles an hour, where this Sportster, I don't know what its top speed is, (laughs) but it better not be much higher than 105. Because at 105, (laughs) oh boy, that Sportster is very much letting you know that shit's happening. You're, right. you're pushing the envelope. Yeah, yep. it might be pushing the envelope yep. a little bit, right? <laughs> Breaks like, oh, you lost me at 95, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> and the Triumph Speedmaster got up to 100 miles an hour. There was no drama, none at all. It was very drama free, but it also was very soul free. Right? Yeah. Well, I, that's the book I was reading, was The Rambler's Guide that's, mm-hmm. that Chris Smith had given me. Hey. That was from the guy who, who uh, does the Janus. Yep. And I, in one of my nights up, I was reading that, and he was just talking about, you know, modern bikes and uh, being built. The you know the, the 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 level of quality is based on how what are your stats, mm-hmm. horsepower, this power, this that, and everything. But they've lost. There's just not the same feel. Yeah. Whereas if you get on something like a Janus or something a smaller bike. Sure, it's not the fastest. It's not the most horsepower. It doesn't have anything, 
but it has more feel. It has more enjoyment. And right. that's what he was talking a lot and about. And this motorcycle <laughs> with its Evo motor, the, the Sportster 1200 Evo motor, this is not rubber mounted. This is rigidly mounted to the chassis. And after this year, they did rubber mount them. And the bikes changed their personality a little bit. Also, the brakes on this are very powerful. The brakes on this are, they're, you know, it's, a, it's not a light bike, but the brakes are very good. Huh. And so a lot of people that are talk about Sportsters, people that know Harley Sportsters are like, yeah, the O2 was kind of the, it was kind of the last time before they started cheapening them out. Yep. And this one is legitimately, a, it's a really nice bike to ride. This, because around this time is when I started working for the big dog dealer. Mm -hmm. And the guy that I went to go work for, this was right at the end of when he was buying Harleys in Europe. And mm -hmm. shipping them back because there was a shortage of Harleys here because they were selling Makes faster sense. than they could make them. Yeah. And this is, like I said, this is the, you're, they're not wrong. Right. Like this is, this is exactly what a Harley Sportster in my mind looks like. It does. It does. It checks the boxes. And I've been said two weeks of riding it, yeah. pretty much commuting back and forth on it, doing freeway every day. It's, it's a good bike. And yeah. it is, it is a, a testament to where we are right now in the economy. Yeah. That, I know things got a little out of control and motorcycle prices got real high for a lot of stuff, but boy, this represents a hell of a bang for your well, buck. Well, now if there's somebody a, wants a potato, potato, potato. There's a glut because that's where we're at now is mm -hmm. there's so many bikes on the new bikes on the market that aren't, yep. exp aren't expensive. Yep. So how long have you owned? I've owned this bike. This bike has been hiding in my shop for almost two years. <laughs> Maybe a little bit. Hiding in that. plain sight. Yeah. Hiding in plain sight. Oh, yeah. Because you said James wrote it. James wrote it. So when I first bought this bike and I brought it into the shop, I was like, okay, well, you know, we're just going to dip it and flip it. You know, not going to do anything with it. It's going to be fine. The man, had, it had sat in his garage for a whole long time. So the tires had to go. The carb was completely cacked. The tank was cacked. So, and it had these ridiculous buckhorn handlebars on it that were the, the sad thing about this bike for the year. Yep. James said, Hey, I'd like to ride that around for a while. And I said, absolutely. You know, you guys have met me. Yeah. Ride it around for a while. Do your thing. Well, do you mind if I change the bars? I don't mind if you change the bars, go right ahead. Don't make any changes that are permanent. Right? So he put those uh, TT bars on it and they're fine. They're just normal handlebars off a motorcycle and they don't make it terrible. You know, you're leaning a little more into it than you would with the ACK -ac gunner handlebars mm, yeah. on it. But actually, that's good on this bike. A Sportster should be a Sportster. Well, and this is mid-mount too, right? It is mid-mount. Yeah. Yep, it's mid-mount. It's a very good combination. The pegs are where they need to be. I'll be honest. I, I've really grown fond of the act -Ac gunner <laughs> bars on my intruder. On your intruder? Because <laughs> like, yeah. I have the carpal tunnels, and yeah. I'm, I'm like, you know, put your hands out like this. Yeah. And that's, yep. that's, that's all That's where they are. Yep. Just, it's the most yeah. neutral. Punching two clowns. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's like 10 and 2 on the handlebar, <laughs> on the wheels. It really is. It's like wearing sweatpants. It's just saying I give up, you know. <laughs> <laughs> that's that's kind of how I feel about Harley in general. It's, it's, like, like, it's like my underwear. They gave up a long time yeah. ago. Could this possibly not hurt? Robert? Could this not hurt my wrist, not hurt my back, and not hurt my knees at the same time? Right. I don't care that's what, the bike for and me. I don't, and I don't care what I look like. And I don't care what it looks like. <laughs> I was talking with Kevin, and I was telling him, I'm like, I wonder how I, can I get a pair of those and put them on my uh, Versys? Like, it would make it so much more comfortable yeah. because... That's like broomstick. They right? make a handlebar riser for that. You know, they make handlebars for that. It's, you know, it's I'm, not I'm, so much the riser; the it's, angle. it's the angle. I, yeah. I used to love just straight like this, but yeah. now for some reason, I, I want more like just like that. Oh, I, I used know. to be the guy who was like putting a broom handle on every yeah. bike I had. Yeah, I know, just I straight. No, I have, I have seen, anymore. I have seen ape hangers on a Suzuki Bergman. You can do anything. You can with do anything you want. <laughs> yeah, you can do anything you want. I so you get many put some on the monkey or the. Go ahead. You get many nibbles on it? Or no, what? none at all. Okay. None. Absolutely zero. Um, huh. Even the ridiculous 73 Harley that we had, the XLH that was oh, in, yeah. we sold that. You know, that came and went. Oh, it did go away. It went away? I was wondering about I that. I sold that fucker. Good. For legit money, too. Excellent. And shame on everybody on Facebook Marketplace is like, you're fucking crazy asking four grand for that bike, man. I'll give you 800 for it right now. You'll go fuck your hat, pal, because I got four grand for it. Oh, yeah. So, was it a hipstery chopper guy or no? No, it was an old guy. Yeah, ah. who's had a couple of Harleys. Yeah, well, that was it was one of the two it's ways. Exactly, it was exactly, a history it's exactly guy who needed to own it. It was yeah. exactly who needed to own it. It was uh, a guy so, who knew exactly what it yeah. was, wanted, has modern Harley. Yeah, and wanted one bike in his garage, 
that was an old throwback to when he got into it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I mean, it, it, it's an it was an absolutely horrible motorcycle, but it was exactly what you needed if you wanted an old Harley. I, seriously, like yeah. to to be like, hey, I'm going to show up on bike night on this, and nobody's going to get confused about what it is. Yeah. There is absolutely this no is, doubt. It was a 1969 Bonneville of Harley Davidsons. It, it was <laughs> well, and I would say that everything, every any dollar that was spent on that bike was spent in 1973. Yep. Yeah, I was gonna say and not a dollar was spent after. I that. remember. I remember the King and Queen seat. All that shit was all in like 89 and 90. Yeah. You could see those for like 500 bucks oh, yeah. all day yeah. long, man. Because their owner was in jail. Yeah. 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 Well, yeah. That was that was just paying the lawyer at that point. Yeah. But yeah, so Z, you know, Chris, no, nobody, yeah. nobody. Hmm. Now today, I had the fellow that came in that sold me the um, Super Cub against my will, right? The flat <laughs> black. Sean, Darth Sean took it for Sean, Sean took advantage of you. Yeah. You did. It's fine. It's okay. <laughs> well, You're just minding your own business. Yeah. I was just minding was my just own business. There and Sean came in. Sean <laughs> showed up with his friend, who the Super Cub was their first bike. Yeah. So his friend's super nice guy. His first bike that he ever owned in his life was a brand new off the dealer's floor, right out of Sills, black Super Cup. Yep. And then he rode that around for a little while and thought, you know what? I like this two-wheel thing. And he bought a, a Rebel 1100. I was going to say, I heard, the, oh. I heard Rebel earlier. And he bought a Rebel 1100 that the previous owner had not one, but two Corbin seats for. Uh, oh. Two passenger and a single passenger. And had all the bags and all the shit. It was like when you bought that um, when you bought that uh, that California. California. It was it was done. Like they'd yeah. done everything. Everything. It was just ready, <laughs> and it just needed a fucking owner, right? Yeah. So there was no money for you to left throw in it. Somebody else had thrown all the money at it, and I think he got it pretty cheap. But then that meant that Super Cub was surplus to his needs. It only had two thousand miles on it. So he came in today and he saw that and he's like, wow, this is just, this is perfect. This is, this is what a sportster. And I said, that's, that's literally the last time Harley said this, we're building a sportster. And after that, Harley just kept trying to make it cheaper. Yep. Right. They kept the sportster. They just kept making it cheaper, shortening the suspension, making it less fun to ride, putting the letter H after it, which meant hugger, which meant even shorter people could ride it. Yep. But a Sportster was meant to be a sporty bike, a bike that was different than their big twins. Keep in mind, the Sportster started in 1959. And when we watched that movie, uh, Biker Boys, what was it? Uh, bike Riders? Homoerotic what now? Well, when we watched the movie Bike Riders, that was set in, what, 64? <laughs> With your shirt, you could be in the movie today. You got the That's true. Yeah, yeah, that's true. So, was it 64 when they started? I think it was. Okay. okay. Because it runs that, up to like mid seventies, but I think when that movie started, my my point yeah, is yeah, not, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Either way, my point is you didn't see a single sportster in that movie. Mm -mm. Not until there were group shots. When there were group shots, you'd see the occasional sportster that showed up for their various bike rallies. Yeah, but everybody in that club rode a big twin. They were they rode FLH, WLAs, that kind of stuff, electric glides. But the sportster was alive and kicking in nineteen fifty nine. Yeah, and it was the higher performance. Harley Davidson. It was the lighter, more agile Harley Davidson. And they kept that alive for a very, very long time. And it wasn't until <clears throat> after this when Sportsters became the cheaper or smaller bike. And people started putting the mini Bob tanks on them and turning their Sportsters into baby super glides, you know, and, you know, essentially hiding a Sportster under, well, you know, I, this is the one I could afford, but now I'm dressing it up to look like a bigger bike or, or a fatter bike. So kind of an interesting thing, but he sat on it today and he sat on it. He's like, oh, no. oh this is great. Oh, I no. love this. And I was like, dude, for $4,500, that's yours. You got it. You can own it. It's had, in our care, it's had the oil change it should have had probably 10 years ago, right? Uh, just based on age, just based on time. It's got two brand new Dunlops on it, two brand new tubes in it. It runs like a scalded dog. Um, oh, don't try to hold on to the handlebars at 95 miles an hour unless you are prepared for a vibratory experience <laughs> of the planet's <laughs> order because the um, these handlebars are not rubber mounted. So every time one of those pistons hits top dead center, a violent thing is transmitted through the handlebars. 
So if you look down at the clocks at 95 miles an hour, you really can't read them, right? This is truly a, still a well, this is, yeah. mounted they, engine. This, this is not. This is the closest thing you're getting to a late 60s muscle car. Or a Sibian sex machine. Exactly. Yeah, exactly. It really does shake a lot. Uh, but anyway, it's what it is. The seat is the most comfortable seat I have sat on in ever for being not a touring bike. Hmm. They nailed that seat. That seat is perfect. So when Hunter Cup sat on it, what do you think? He loved it. And yeah. and I could tell that he was already making plans. So I was like, good, that's a good thing to have. Because you need to have more than one motorcycle. He needs to put down a non-refundable deposit. He does. <laughs> yes, he does. I think he needs to make I think he needs, makes a decision now he can think about all winter. He can fantasize and I'll store it for you. Well, I'll he, keep it. He I'll kind of Chris just for say it. the ATM machine he by did. saying the non-refundable <laughs> yes. deposit. He kind of okay. we, uh, we know at Cleveland Moto we're sensitive about the deposit word. Yes. He he yeah. kind of he kind of made a little bit of a mistake when he would take money for the cub. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, he did. Because I was I, there was a moment where I was like, maybe I'll just roll this cub into this. Well, maybe I'll just roll the cub into the Harley. Right? Well, maybe I'll do that. But it was it was interesting. And, then, and the worst thing about this entire conversation is the fact that Phil has just said the magic words that I was looking at last week, which is flat black super cub. Flat and black went, super cub. I'm like, God damn it. <laughs> yeah, and I was I was kind of like, oh, I the only out. super cub I don't like is the flat black one. And I walked out and I went, God damn it, you got the one I want. <laughs> but Pete said the same thing. <laughs> Give it to Pete. Uh, <laughs> Come on, Pete, do it. <laughs> Which part about it? It's a usable bike. It's oh, yeah. Usable. But I said you actually like the color. I like oh. the color. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I do. Okay. Well, the, right. pro the problem is I would immediately turn over to the same guy. I don't that, like the red sheet on it. Uh, oh, you don't? No. Oh. I don't care for that. The guy that the guy that did your, uh, your <laughs> it needed bike. some color, man. It needed some color somewhere. Oh. <laughs> I don't That's, care for that. That, that fucking that, seat. that guy that did all the pinstriping on your tiki bike mm -hmm. needs yeah. that cub. Oh, he does. He That's does. a really good idea. Oh, yeah, he, he needs that cub. Pin it up, that man. is a blank slate. It yeah. truly is. It is. it is ready to go. Mm. Ooh, okay. just tell him straight red, this red and white pinstripes with that red seat. Here you, go, here you go, Kevin Moore. Here you go, Kevin just Moore. Just rock yeah. it and roll it. Oh, man. Yeah, yeah. Your chocolate's in my peanut butter now. I like that. <laughs> I like everything about that idea. Yeah. Oh, that's I cool. I mean, look what he did with the flat back vest, though. I mean, it was perfect. Oh, no, he, he did. Like, oh, absolutely. He is definitely the cure for all flat black. Yep. I want to paint my bike and flat black. It's going to be great. No, it's not. That will, that will completely change that bike into yeah. something new. And we'll start a whole fad. I think, well, that happened, you know, yeah. you know how many Honda well, dreams? Hondas. Yeah. How many old Honda dreams you see that had the pinstripe yes. job done to Absolutely. them? Absolutely. Yeah. That's exactly what needs to start and happening. And I think there. you're right. I think you're exactly right. Because we've gotten to that point, too, where the Honda, the, when the Super Cub first came out, it was so novel that it had been gone for so long in our country. So when it came back, everybody's like, oh, you know, and I got that fancy red and white one, right? And the blue and white one's yeah, also oh, yeah. real pretty, yeah, right? Yeah. But yeah, the flat black one. Yeah, you, you're yeah, right. No, absolutely. Yeah, that thing immediately just for, roll it straight to roll it straight to pinstripe. It's there good. was a super cub at the barber when I was there last mm -hmm. week, and Piper or Peggy was all like, "Oh my god, look at that! That's so beautiful." I'm like, "Yeah, that's like a 2022." And yeah, it's brand new bike. Like, what? Yeah. It's brand new. I'm like, yeah. I'm once like, you know, can once, buy one. Once, once, yeah. once Becky gets comfortable on two wheels. Yeah. The blue and white one is probably what she's going to end up with because it's a nice, big, tall, sturdy 150 that will not uh, drop, will not fall over on her. I 100% like the blue one. That's yeah, my and they're beautiful. But that flat black is calling out for a pinstripe. Yes, it is. It really is. <laughs> that's that's totally fucking on point there. Or uh, some machine gun barrels on it. Also, also that. <laughs> oh man, anybody else that they want to get into before we get into the show notes? No. Oh. Well, I could talk about going to Barber a little bit. Yes, you can. you can. So we were going down to visit uh, Peggy's nieces. They live in Owens Crossing, Alabama. And uh, it was out of the way a little bit by a couple hours, but, you know, we did going down in two legs. So we stopped you know, after five or six hours at a little hotel, which was lovely for 80 bucks a night, to be honest. And then the next morning we got up and drove mm -hmm. another four or five hours and drove to Birmingham to Barber Motorsports park and museum and uh had a really good time there i only spent a, i mean spent a few hours which is probably about enough to walk i mean it's you know about five floors from top to bottom and uh it was me peggy and piper and we really enjoyed ourselves um amazing collection of motorcycles really enjoyed it piper was just enthralled they were they they were basically super bikes out on the track and she just was loving the sound and 
trying to take up all the memory in Peggy's phone videotaping. I'm like, you can't, <laughs> you can't just sit there and videotape for 10 minutes. You know what I mean? <laughs> I got a kick out of the uh, glass bottom bridge over the track was fun. Yeah, and uh, cool. Peggy freaked out when I jumped up and down on it. She was like, <laughs> <laughs> she was like ah, da, da, da. taking any chances. But, uh, you know, obviously all the old Hondas really caught my eye and stuff. Yep. Hey, what uh, is the so smoke? The, is that you? What? Is that you? What? You do a little vape. I'm just making sure. It's not coming out of the board. It's coming Thank out of the, the sound guy. Right. It's coming out of the sound guy. I don't, so know, where the, <laughs> I don't know where the homeowner hides the uh, fire extinguisher. You're so. fine. Uh, you know, I, he definitely has a thing for Lotus. Uh, like the yeah. whole yep. bottom oh, basement. Wow. Oh, yeah. A lot of Lodi in there. And yep. there were some really beautiful, like, hand-pounded hand, hand pounded aluminum spacecraft uh, race a Lotus, you know, cars that were just amazing there. Yep. Um, you know, bikes that really stood up, they had, he had the whole milliard collection. So oh, the, yeah. the KZ, uh, what would it be? 1800. Yeah. 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 Two, not, you know, yeah. the uh, flying milliard. Well, no, I think he actually had a KZ. KZ 12 Thir cylinder. The 13 right. uh, yeah, times two. The 2600. Yeah. 2600. I yeah. really, I was kind of, I like the SS 100, which was a Honda 50 twin. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. So a hundred. Yeah. That was good. Um, you know, they had the 48 cylinder motorcycle there. They had a couple of really cool suitcase bikes that I, I took pictures of. Um, a couple of the, the one I had never seen the one Honda. It was a V twin liquid cooled dirt track racer. It was uh, the the 750. Okay, so they yeah. had the the Honda. No, but that that's a air cooled. So they had the 750 right, side by side. They had the Honda 750 and the XR 750 Harley Davidson. But then they had this one really weird one. I'll show you a picture of it later. But is it the V or is it the parallel? It was a V. It's a v. Uh, let me just try to find it briefly. I don't want to get too much into. it. Yeah, so look at this motorcycle, Phil, and see if you know what that is because it's the red one. Yeah, here, hand red, it, I remember hand, seeing hand, that. Hand this yeah. to Phil. What is? I mean, that looks like a purpose-built liquid-cooled V-twin motor. Completely is water-cooled in the most the most obscenely side valve I've ever seen, ever. I've never heard of that bike. No, never seen that bike. That's, I, that's, yeah, yeah, that's just so that, that one. That one kind of blew me away. Yeah. Um, not a lot of Honda race bikes, a lot of Yamaha race bikes. Oh, he had this wow. whole thing where it was like the progression of like Honda Yamaha race bikes all the way up through, you know, like the sixties and into the seventies. Mm -hmm. Well, so I was a little disappointed not to see something like a, an RC, you know, or well, as, our, as our friend Dean will attest, Yamaha is not far down the road. <laughs> uh, he yeah. must like Yamaha a little more than Honda, <laughs> but, he must. but he had the, you know, the Honda dream, the super Hawk, the CL, the, all the notable Hondas. Yep. Sandcast CB750 oh. up close. It was kind of nice to really look at that. Hey, Sleepy, let me see that just, real quick. You know, get get eyes on the, you know, the like, I never really got to see a Sandcast that, where you could actually see the Sandcast cases and stuff like yeah. that. And I had to point that out to Piper. I'm like, this is one of the original ones. Right. Sand, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I think, so the Honda was running this thing called an NS750. Okay. So uh, early 80s, 81, 82, 83, 84. And they built it starting with a Honda XC500. Okay. So they used the motor that we know as an XC500, and they built that out. Shaft drive, right? That was what the XC was. Yeah, because this reminds they me of chopped a it up lot. and they made it into uh, Chaney Chain. Yeah, this so what, do they turn it this way? I then? will show you. Yeah, because so. this this is giving right? me XC, early VT. I mean, early it looks VT like vibes. a v, it looks like a shadow motor, really. So I believe they had one of those down at the um, AMA Museum in Pickerington, also. So these um, these NS750s mm. were uh, 81, 82, 83, I think, or maybe 82 or 83, I can't remember exactly. But uh, the, the idea behind is liquid-cooled uh, Honda going out into a class oh, that wow. they were previously not competitive in because the Harley-Davidson's yeah, kind of owned that that's class. That's exactly what he's looking at. And the, uh, the build of the bikes, I mean, they're, they're just, they're freakish. When you think about where technology was yeah. in the early yep. 80s, you know, and there were, there weren't but a couple of these things and wow. they're out there. But I guess that that must be what he's got going yeah. on over it's, there. It's a if if it's a Honda and I haven't seen it, then it's pretty <laughs> it's special. Pretty, it's fucking it's, rare. It's, that's, it's, that's definitely the same. It's motor. a different yeah. tank, but same motor. Yeah, it's it, well, there was more than one of them. Built. And that bottom that bottom end is totally VT. 
It is. So yeah, it is. Neat. But mm-hmm. that top end cylinder configuration is just wild with that valley. Yeah. With all that stuff in there. <laughs> That's but insane. It, it, it doesn't look like a Honda motor though. It looks like very mm. European. Oh no, it looks very well, it looks very Honda on the bottom. To me it end. looks like the, yeah, a, the bottom and not yeah. the top. To me, it looks like a GL500 motor sitting sideways or a CX500 motor sitting mm, sideways. Okay. Sort that of, yeah. exactly what it and was. That's or, what I see yeah. when I look at it. But then they then they have to rotate the heads, though, is the bigger Correct. problem because yep, the, yep. the, everything has yep. to go one way or the other. When I look at that motor, all I'm seeing is a CX500 slash CX, CX650 put in sideways yeah. to make the chain go in the right direction, <laughs> you mm-hmm. know? And that's right where Honda would have been in 1982. Because they were still kind of experimenting then. Well, the I mean, f- the radiators are stolen straight off that bike. So. Oh, yeah. yeah. The funny thing is Piper and I had, previous to this, we had been out in the garage looking at the Encyclopedia of Motorcycles. Yes. And yeah. so we were going through that, and she was like, oh, that's cool, and it's cool. And so basically we, we went to the Encyclopedia of Motorcycles. Yes, uh, oh, all absolutely. the bikes that we were They're looking right at there. were he, all right there. So a couple of years ago, the first time I went to Barber, so here we go. History story. We showed up before opening time and I'm sitting in, cause we, this is before we, we were at, um, right after Katrina, we went to the, uh, deals gap, tail the dragon. And I had an R 65 in the bed of my fucking pickup truck. And I was headed up to meet you. You had the bus mm-hmm. and the dragster 180 and everything else. That was that year. And we met, um, what's his name? The, uh, Brown, the chef guy. Oh crap. I can't remember now. Alton Brown. Yeah, Alton Brown. That was that year. Yep, that was that year. So we showed yep. up. We're in the parking lot of Barber. I've got an R65 in the back of my truck. We're 30 minutes ahead of ahead of the opening. And this guy comes out, and he goes, so, hey, you want to come in? I'm like, well, dude, you're not open for another half hour. He's like, come on, get your ass in here. And I'm walking around. I'm looking at everything, and it's the kid in the candy store just like you. <laughs> I mean, oh my God, every motorcycle that has ever been made that you ever want to look at it's is all right at there, man. Barber. It's all right there. And I'm walking around. I'm like, this is amazing. And then I get over to the big, giant stack of little tiny scooters and there's the Vespa Allstates. And anybody that knows has been to Barber and looked at the Vespa Allstates, they look at them and they go, what the actual fuck? Yep. <laughs> oh yeah. yeah. Because the 59 is red right. and the 62 is blue. Yep. And they supposed ha- to be. And they have the collars reversed. And I went, what the yeah. shit? And the guy is, the guy, the, the, the steward is like right behind me. And he's walking behind, kind of watching what we're doing. And I'm walking around I'm like, well, that's not right. And I'm paying, I'm looking at every bike and I'm pulling everything apart and looking at everything and walking around and walking around. I'm re- the Cervetta that was at the top of the stack of the Cushman's. And I'm like, okay, that's not right at all. And about that time, he's like, okay, Come with me. And I'm like, fuck, I'm getting kicked out. <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. yeah. They're going to ask me to leave. I'm now. like, oh God, I'm being an ass. I'm being that right. asshole. Now he marches me down to the storage room where all of the bikes that are waiting for renovation are. And he's like, he's showing me around all the bikes that you don't get to see and everything else. I'm like, how do I work here? No, How yeah, 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 do yeah. I work here? Like, I want to be one of the guys that just all I do all day long is just fix the carburetor. And just, or, <laughs> and just be fastidious. Just oh, be yeah. fastidious about and they like, have, oh, I saw a picture in a book, in a magazine oh, in 1964. How do I and work here's the here? Bike. Like, I literally, I literally am taking the job interview right there. I and I'm like, how do I do this for a living? Yeah. And unfortunately, I'm that asshole. That I mean, every one of those bikes you could eat off of. I oh, mean, yeah. I'm there. The, the rule that I've always heard is that every, every vehicle in that facility is 30 minutes away from running. Mm-hmm. It's 30 minutes away from track ready. So everything in there, yeah. I think everything in there is definitely, and it's, it is yeah. amazing. If you have never been, it is the most amazing motorcycle experience you're ever going to have. Yeah. I, 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 I don't know Uh-oh. Uh-oh. <laughs> because as much as I liked it and as much as I was definitely absolutely impressed, right. Uh, wheels through time. Yeah. I, 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 mean, I, I actually think I'm, I kind of dug that more. Wheels through, and it's not even the type of bikes I'm normally. I'm I'm never probably going to own a you know all straight those, four, uh, straight four and stuff. Right. But but I l- really like wheels through time. Dude, and wheels through time guys, had a feel. It felt the fe- yeah. I mean, and it, that, you know, and it, that might and starting be, bikes up and stuff. Now, yeah. if they'd have pulled some of these bikes up and been like, hey, hey, everybody, come on over here. We're going to be starting up the well, Milliard Twenty Eight Hundred. You missed yeah. that by a week, though, Mister Smith. You well, are famous too. 
Um, that video <laughs> I did has got like 25,000 views and everybody agrees with you. There's so many people on there that are like, yeah, tell Matt to make a book and all this stuff. And so it became a whole thing and people are like, yeah, I'd buy that book. Oh, nice. So there you Smith go. put that out there. That Yeah, uh, I think that's there. a good idea. Yeah. I think that that idea of putting that together is a really, really good idea. <laughs> yeah. And Wheels of Time is well, that's and that's an entirely that's different fantastic. experience. That's a, that's a redneck fantastic. opening up his garage and going, look at my toys. And yeah. you are right. I miss. I know I wasn't there, and I'm not sorry that I wasn't there right. for yeah. Vintage Days. It's a bit yeah. much. I'm not sure that I'll ever make it to Vintage Days. Yeah. Mm. I might. You know, we'll see. But we'll see how that goes. One of the one of these days. But one the, of the, one but of these the main years. reason I would have wanted to go to Vintage Days was so I could go see the museum while oh, yeah. I was there. And yeah. now that Too I've already done well, that, yeah. the, what is the VJMC? Yeah. Vintage Japanese Motorcycle Club. I used to be a field rep. Right. Well, they have they have a huge display up there all the time, which is why I'm surprised you haven't been, actually. Yeah. Well, I, and I was loaded up. I had five bikes on a trailer, and yeah. I was going to leave the next morning, and I got the phone call. You have a phone call from an inmate at Cleveland Prison. <laughs> it was my buddy that was supposed to be going with me who Oops. got thrown in jail for purchasing crack cocaine picked a hell of a plus oh. one man oh man no yeah. kidding i'm like bro that guy had no sense of timing i'm like you wh what were you doing you thought yeah, you were gonna you get the I best cocaine in fucking alabama dude well, I'm just like, get there uh, first what are you, <laughs> <laughs> you were, were were you buying crack so that you could do it while we were going to alabama yeah like, right yeah, what's, the, this, what's the plan this, on that like he's not like me, it's not, not no it's not that i just i just i freaked out i had to have it and i went wrong and i got tried and i'm in jail yeah you did and then i'm, I'm like when well, the peggy at the time i mean I, I was still you know sleep apnea me and everything i'd just come off of bouncing my car off of the uh, uh guardrails on the uh, trip out to east coast she's like i'm not let you cannot drive 10 hours by yourself no, down there and back not at all there's no way you would have made that one of one of these, okay, one well, of these if his years. buddy would have brought the Coke back, he'd have been no, fine. No, oh, yeah. have been golden. <laughs> Absolutely. The guy was looking out for you. <laughs> one, of the, one of these times, because I, I wouldn't have driven one bit. I'm like, get your crack ass up in there. And fucking, <laughs> Come I'm on, crack. Wake me up when we're there. Yeah, right? <laughs> and, and then about three hours later, we'd have been there. Since, <laughs> since Becky, Becky keeps talking about buying a camper, like, this is going to be a thing. We're just going to get a camper. We'll oh, park at the top of the hill. You want a camper? I've got a perfect yeah. Oh, yeah, one yeah, for yeah, you. Yeah, you know what? You know what? The problem is, I made you the problem is I made you an offer and rescinded the offer immediately. And the reality is I don't know which one of us would have made out better, probably no. you. <laughs> I mean, I'll take anything. If you I had know. it, John, it'd still be working on it. Oh so, no. Yeah. <sighs> no, sir. <laughs> no. It's basically it's, it was basically his versus straight no down, no return. It's yeah. gotta go. It, I'll tell you what, I'll just bring it over here. You can have it. Oh god. Oh boy. I need a dumpster. Oh my God, man! What a strip! No, I think it would be difficult to even scrap it because it's like oh no, they, I just want to strip the back off of those it. Those days are gone, my yeah. friend. But it's all you, bro. Yeah, like, those, like those I days know, are gone. I know the dumpster. I know the uh, the dude, the Cuyahoga. What do you call it? Dump. Is West like right 140th there. is right there, but I'm going to tell you the days of you just showing up with an RV oh, no. and going, that is now yours in scrap value. Give me my check for 500. Oh. Give me my 500 cash. You now own this. Those days are gone. No, man. no, no, no. I don't want to scrap they the whole thing. I just want to scrap everything from the cab back. All right. This doesn't even, have, it's fiberglass, so you can't even scrap. It's not even can't aluminum. You don't no. even get all the aluminum. Oh, I don't fire. want the money. I just want it gone. No, no. And that's where you're going to realize. Right. Well, you have to buy 700, get a dumpster. Right. Get a, a yard long dumpster and scrap it all. And scrap the whole back end. Like I'm not looking for money on the back end. I'm just looking for two rails and a, and a motor. You need a five yard dumpster and at least seventeen sawzall blades. Right. Exactly. Yeah. And that's or, the that's or an, really an excavator the with a thumb. And <laughs> and and the reality is, and the reality is, <laughs> I'm gonna say this between <laughs> Phil, <laughs> between <laughs> Phil and Becky. If I have a spare five minutes in my day, I'm doing work. <laughs> <laughs> like I like there is no free time. <laughs> Yeah. Um, important update for our Patreons. Mm. Uh, one, if you'll remember, not that long ago. Inflation went up and we have to charge you all $10 more? Quite the opposite, my oh, friend. Oh, crap. Quite the opposite. <laughs> uh, our, trying our, to get more money. Our absolute, <laughs> our absolute legend, David Swearingen. Swearingen. Oh, yeah, wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait. Yes. Wait, is it that one? No, it's this one. Swear engine. Swear engine. There it is. Swear engine. Swear engine. He's Dan, back. if you would like more, you can have some. He's back. Um, very happy to announce that Swear engine had to take a time out for life. Nope. 
He's back. Excellent. He's back. He is game on. He's he's in he's mm-hmm. in the game. Um, so happy to have him back. It is cool. Uh, super super neat. Uh, Nick Childs. Hey guys, I was a few episodes behind until my dad mentioned Pete and the gang would be passing through Carbondale, Illinois on monkeys. Yeah, bet. <laughs> I got my IT degree at SIU yep. in 2020 and loved the three and a half years I spent there. Um, Salukis. The Salukis. Yes, yeah. Saluki Salukis. dogs, yeah. <laughs> That's how how you do you fucking guys know this stuff? <laughs> Something close to water. My cousin went there. SIU. It's fucking hilarious. Dude, my daughter okay. goes to OSU and I don't even know the name of the mascot. <laughs> <laughs> that's, Buckeye. that's the Buckeyes, right? I guess. I don't know. Now, oh Salu- Salukis God. is so weird on your on your head that you yeah, have to right. remember oh it. Oh, my God. <laughs> so, 1984, when I was on my bicycle trip across the United States, I got hit by a car in Carbondale. Really? Yep. Yeah, yep. Wait, wow. you rode a bos- bicycle across the United States? 1984. That doesn't even surprise me. <laughs> How old were you in 1984? 18. 18. Yeah. Just wow. graduated high school. But so this <laughs> this trip that we just did on the monkeys somewhat retraced that route. Not not mile for mile, route for route, but um in spirit and a lot of crossover. And 40 goddamn years later. And right. 40 years later right. and yes. 40 goddamn years later. Yeah, a lot That's of miles later part. too. <laughs> Okay, I love the 3.5 years I spent there. I tried tracking down Mr. Hempfling. Is that right? On Facebook, but no such luck. Yeah, no shit. I have no presence. He doesn't he doesn't exist on the internet. <laughs> Pete Pete only has a wall phone and it's the old rotary style. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, well, here, I'll, and his I'll only you, fans, but you got to be down to get that's that. That's true. We ended up not crossing at Carbondale on this trip. We were going to take the ferry which crosses from Festus, Missouri. And luckily when we came to a fork in the road, we called ahead and the ferry only runs Friday, Saturday, Sunday. We were on a say a Wednesday or Tuesday, whatever day of the week it was. It wasn't a Friday, Saturday or Sunday. So we said, well, we either got to go down and cross the bridge at Chester, which puts you into Carbondale right. or there, the surrounds. Or you, we, we said, well, let's continue on a northeastern trajectory. We ended up crossing in St. Louis. There you go. But being on the monkeys, we couldn't cross on the interstate bridge. Yeah. So we had to cross the Martin Luther King Jr. Bridge, which dumps you right off into East St. Louis, which oh, became a, and, a whole and other uh, story. And then they got robbed. <laughs> well, okay. we almost got robbed. That's true. We didn't. The point is very simple. I believe it was Chris Rock. After he said there's no sex in the champagne room, he also said, no matter where you're in America, if you're on Martin Luther King Boulevard. Yep. Watch your ass. Yep. So um, here we go. There was a Martin Luther King in Cincinnati. There was one in Columbus. There was one in oh, there's <laughs> Louisville. There there's was one, one in New Orleans. It's the cheap, it's the easiest way to get up from uh, uptown to uh, cross the bridge. If I'm not too late, I'd love to ride my track bike down from St. Louis mm, responsibly to show them the amazing roads around there. It would give me great reason to just cruise and save my knee pucks for later. So he, he missed out, though, because that was... Well, he was going to ride down from St. Louis. We ended up going right through St. Louis. Yeah. See? You wouldn't and, have had to ride down. Uh, yeah. Sorry, so Nick, Nick Childs could have met you. We'll shut up. Shut up, Nick. Nick. We'll catch you next And remember, time. Nick Childs is also the guy who gave you the recommendations for track days. That's right. Yes. So uh, Nick's great podcast listener, totally on the point. Absolutely on the point. Uh, very, very slick. Am I seeing so, smoke over here? Yep. There you <laughs> go. Oh, okay. Sleepy right. again. I just... I, so, I, did, I didn't know why something was on fire down here. No, uh, yeah, it's, and it's with, the, with the shit show we got going with plugs and wires and everything yeah. here. The, the electrician in this room is just right. sucky. Right. There's just an entire bottle of just flammable shit on the table yeah. for yeah. no good reason. Just, yep, um, that's exactly the, right. It's interesting. The, the kind yeah. of source of fire. The super, the super for this building is just a complete asshole. <laughs> so, so here we go. Now. So I just thought that was fantastic that, um, that, that there we have that. Uh, I just... I have to say that I've been so happy with the Patreons and I went ahead and I ordered an extra case of Tanukis. Yep. Nice. Ooh. So we tracked down the supplier. We ordered an extra case of Tanukis and Renee has been going through our Patreon members Yep. and been boxing up some extra special Renee party packs. Renee has been stuffing boxes religiously. She has. Yep. She has. And we've been sending out about, about six or seven a day on work days to our Patreon members. So if you are a Patreon member, you you know don't throw away anything that comes from Cleveland Moto. Correct. I, I want to give a good I want to give a plug yeah. to our sound guy here, Cinch, 
Motor Stories and more. Yes. His time lapse video of the Aurora Borealis is a must see. It really was cool. cool, right? Yeah. I mean, we don't often get to see the Aurora Borealis down here in Cleveland Way. But he did an excellent job and gotten some like nice purples and greens. Really and stuff. good colors. Yeah, it was really that neat. Was, that we was can a good finally video. see the world how he sees it. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, but you know what? No, but check this out. I thought about something. So allegedly, this guy that might be me, but might not be. Allegedly has allegedly has a living tanuki. Like a hundred percent, I have a tail. Giant testicles. Yeah. It, well, no ta- well, I mean, giant, for, giant testicles. That, but no te- blind, it's right. a blind, blind tanuki. tanuki. <laughs> In a ah, fucking ah, everyday, ah. it's the little cutest little fucker ever. Yeah, you're just like, it's a tanuki, that's great. Yeah. The, uh, we, it's been, it's been one of those things where you're just kind of like, the season's slowing down for us a little bit, so we're mm. going to throw, we're going to throw some love back out to our people, and we just are very happy well, to be able to do if it. If I ever move my shit out of her corner... Her corner, <laughs> we will get Renee back into that press. Well, the, the winter is coming. Winter folks. is coming. We are going to be making T-shirts. Remember the last time she made shirts? She only made six hundred. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So you know, for what it's worth, if you're complaining that we don't have your extra large or double extra large or triple extra large, because last fucking, year, why are you guys so big, man? Yeah. We went through so many. Fu- we had we built so many shirts that right now I did. I looked the other day. I've got about. 200 medium shirts left over. So if you're medium, let us know. As a guy who owned a clothing company, yeah. never make mediums. There's only like seven medium people in the yeah, entire right. United <laughs> States, dude. Ameri- no the average. <laughs> Ameri- <laughs> Americans start at extra large. Yeah. yeah. Well, largest shrink down to medium. I was, right. try- I was trying for a customer that came in the other day. He's, he was on tour, came through, wanted a Cleveland Motor shirt and everything else. But unfortunately, he was a double XL, and I was like, "Man, that is not easy." So when we make a run, we we make shirts this year. We're gonna lean a little, yeah, we're yeah. lean into the carb department a little bit better. You know, what you could do is cut the cut the, the medium shirts, cut yeah. the design out, and just sell them as uh, jacket patches. Jacket yeah. patches. <laughs> nice. Has anybody else just been savoring the beautiful weather? I mean, like, oh yeah, every day when, oh, it's, yeah. when it warms up, and I'm like, oh, this is so nice and. But at the same time, I'm like, I'm not fucking looking forward to winter. I, <laughs> yeah, I'm, well, like, I'm like, I need, like, I've been going for walks a lot and stuff like that. I need and it's three like, more months of fall. I need, well, I'm yeah, like, this yeah. is perfect for me. I just need this to stay this way. I don't the, need it to the, get. But it's hard to do distance riding in this fucking weather. Like, <laughs> like it's not, I guess not an adventure bike, but if you want to have fun, like on a sporty bike. Right. It's like, what do you do? Because you have to dress for like 38 degrees yep. in the morning. Then by noon, it's 87 degrees. And like, you have nowhere to put anything. It just like, because oh, you need electronic well, heating filaments in your leathers. Yeah, exactly. Pretty much. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it, the it, weather, the weather dipped. And as soon as it did, Riley's rear legs went, nope. They quit working. And I was like, God damn it. The back of your dog quit <laughs> working. My dog quit. But I just think the, the leaves this year have been amazing. Sick. It is oh, like yeah. neon. Today, today, yeah. Today on the way to work with the sun coming up. Like there was everything from like the deepest red all the way through like yep. the fluorescent is yellow. Oh, everything, everything, everything in, in this between. everything in this neighborhood is yellow and orange. Yeah. That's good, beautiful. We like so, it. Oh, that's right. So last week we did the fall foliage. Yes, ride you did, with Cliff LaRoque. Yeah, and uh, what a great group this time. This time this year, everybody was cool. Nobody like you know every year there's usually somebody that's a little squirrely or something. Everybody with like knew how to stay in lines. Everybody rode well. Nobody got hurt. Uh, a couple of people, Adam showed up on his Cushman. On his Cushman. That lasted for like a mile. <laughs> 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 or maybe two. But, but the funny part was, is I have him on camera and I'm like, what are the odds you're going to make to the end of this ride? He goes, zero percent. Zero percent. Which was great. There's a zero percent chance of me making this ride. We, yeah. we la- you laugh about that. And, we, and Phil, would you, you, yeah, the other day you're like, Hey, come up here and look at this Cushman. Yeah, this a dude rolled in. 1956 Cushman looked like the. Honestly, it looked like it was a year old. Yeah, it was just just been hidden in a garage somewhere for a long time up in Michigan, and a guy came upon it and got it. He rebuilt the motor, and this is not a. This is just. I mean, this is an implement. I mean, this thing is to call it a motorcycle is a stretch. It's a two wheeled. Project. Well, that's know? what when Adam pulled up, I guess yeah. I never paid attention to him too much, so I don't know well, he, a lot about Cushman's. No, but but yeah. you looked at the front, and I was like, 
That's just, those are spring doors. Yep. That's all they are. Oh, absolutely. There's no, there's no actual absolutely. shock absorber. They're literally spring door well, springs. We, you know, growing up, growing, <laughs> growing into the scooters, we were priced. I mean, I literally was priced out of the Cushman era because they were all the old Cushman guys. They're all dead now. They're and those bikes dead. are and worth bikes are like, I was expecting like, you know, like, I, I guess I never paid that much attention to them. So like when I actually looked at it, I was expecting like, okay, for the money that they were going for, mm, yep. they'd have like these amazing oh, little no. hydraulic brakes no, or something. No, no, no. they're just piles of shit. Yeah, yep. like they're like somebody cobbled them together and somehow mass marketed well, it. Yeah, it's insane. They're a, a deluxe mini bike. Yeah, yeah. It literally yeah. is an overgrown mini bike. The Eagle is a deluxe mini bike. Right. The Eagle was the top of their game. Everything else they had in their range, like even like the Highlander and stuff, is a those mini bike. Were just just mini bikes. Yeah, That's right. all they were, You're and right. they weren't even necessarily as good as some mini bikes. Um, you know. A lot of mini bikes had a thing called a brake on it. Yep. That actually would stop it. A lot of the Cushmans had a strap of metal going around the same part of the wheel that your sprocket was hooked to. That would slow it down. Yeah, it was just metal on metal. It was just a band <laughs> brake. I mean, a band brake isn't going to be, you know, no great for stopping. No well, was there any friction material inside it? I mean, nope. there's friction. Band brake, dude. Nope. Metal on no. metal. You hit it and it literally what would it wrap does. itself around the rear tire. It just goes from being metal sliding against metal to metal rubbing against metal. Well, no, it's not that. It's not on the tire. It's no, on some, the hub. Some of, no, on some, the of hub. Them, some of them were on the tire no, and some of them were not. Not a Cushman. Well, some of the mini bikes were, yeah, but yeah. not Cushman. But the Cushmans were always, the worst a Cushman ever was, was a band brake on a hub. That's what they were. That's yeah. just how they worked. And that's fine. You know, it, well, it had, were, there's a place for that. They were one fast. Yeah, nobody. Yeah, nobody, was a, yeah, nobody set in land speed records. Right, it was literally was a lawnmower lawnmower strapped to a frame. <laughs> yeah, but that's all they were, and yeah. they were you know they were they cheap. worked. But you know you keep in mind that <clears throat> that Cushman Empire that ended up going into you know being all the vehicles in all the factories in America, yep. or how you got a foreman from one side of the factory to the other side of the factory, or how you got the parts and the stuff for the guys that were the my uncle was the. The engineer, the service engineer at General Electric. So he had a factory that had about 10,000 people in it that he was responsible for making sure the machines ran. Hmm. And he had a Cushman and his Cushman had every tool the man would need to fix 75 different kinds of machines. And he'd have to do that. That's what he did. Where was the plant located? He was on the east side. Which the one? Euclid. You man, oh man, big just, fucking place. Yeah, think about those plants that yeah. used used to be over there. Yeah. I mean, just Gee, that's Euclid. that's what Cleveland, Ohio was. It was like, huge plants. They had White Motor and stuff like that. When I was a kid and we got to go there <clears throat> to see where he worked, Golly. it blew me away how yeah. big the place was. Yeah, and it was the production floor was was huge, but then remember, there's also R and D in the front that was set six stories, right? So when you're driving along and you see this monolith GE over there. Yeah, that's, they built everything. You know, but that's been like, I remember the same thing with my dad when he worked at TRW up there in Pleasant Valley before they broke that building up into a hundred buildings. It was the same thing. Like we'd get in a cart and he would drive me across the floors and all that stuff. It, well, yeah. It just went on forever, man. Yeah. It just went on forever. That's when manufacturing was still here and like, you know, just (laughs) Westinghouse. (laughs) You guys remember Westinghouse? Westinghouse, absolutely. Yeah. 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 And when we consider how much of Cleveland, where we're from, was- these mega factories, these yeah. really truly mega factories, where you got a parking pass that said you were in parking lot D, <laughs> yeah. or you were in parking lot F, and like as you got more seniority, your letter got lower, <laughs> so you didn't have to walk as far to get to your locker. And I remember going into my dad's locker room when he worked at Reliance Electric. They had an open house day, and I went in there, and I just never in my life saw so many fucking lockers oh, that yeah, I was just yeah. like. How the hell do all these people work here? And, you know, it wasn't like there was a sink. There were these round sinks that could could deal with 50 guys coming up to the sink at the same time. And, just, and the urinal was the same sink, same only urinal. in a different room. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? You so, know, yeah, it's a real thing. The powder, the soap powder. Was, it was, I was a kid, I used to oh, love going God, in there with the soap, soap powder. powder. Yeah. And the other thing was, was each of the uh, around each of these plants, mm. there's machine shops and tool and die yeah. shops and just 
just all sorts well, of ancillary businesses and bars for the guys well, after well, sure. and, and, yeah. and restaurants. But the reality second. is, you know, we talk about Chinese Chinese company town factory towns where uh, you know I always joke about Zongshan. Zongshan is a very good example. Zongshan is a city and. That's a giant factory with all of the ancillaries around it. Cleveland was the same way. It was a giant factory town. Except it was 40 factories. Right. Except it was 40 different companies. Yeah. And people supporting those 40 yeah. companies. And that, and, but the factory supporting the people is the more important part, is you had this entire— Because I moved here, and I'm like, where are all the people? All right, so what was your point? You were saying yeah, halfway yeah. through it. <laughs> Sorry. I did not mean— <laughs> no, no, it, it was when Phil was talking about the the big plants and stuff like yeah. that. That that's always been interesting to me. I worked at General Motors way back in the eighties, and I just loved. I did going not know plants. that. Yeah, so I loved walking through these plants and seeing all the thousands and thousands of workers and all the cars pulling into the parking lots. You know, before the shift starts, and yeah. it, it it just all the ancillary business. So you go up and down like a Brook Park Road, yeah. and there was all those additional businesses that supported. The big plants, and uh, so that's one of the things I met. You know, everybody talks about immigration, and I know I don't want to touch on the politics of it, yeah. but the thing of it is, is if the if people come here and we set up the factories on this side of the border and let them work there, and maybe they're taking some jobs away or whatever, I don't know. But all the ancillary stuff, you know yeah. what I mean? Yeah. So having cool. people work here, and then there's the supervisor, the maintenance, you know, all the guys, plus all the shops and everything. Like, you know, there was this big push in the '80s and '90s where Everything was going south of the border, and mm-hmm. it was like, well, then you lose not just you lose everything. It's okay, so they if you go south of the border, get cheaper labor, or whatever you lose, all that stuff is going. But out what of, we out of have country. north of the border that they don't have south of the border is we have all the infrastructure right. Right. to to support that, yeah. including hospitals and schools. Oh and, yeah, and, and, absolutely, and, and high quality living and that kind of stuff. So I don't care if you want to, you know, wake up in the morning in Mexico, drive across, park, come up. Work at a factory and go back home in the evening, or stay up here for a week and go back. I mean, like, well, I'd rather have and I'd rather have it happening in this country, yeah. than in a in, in well, any other foreign country. And that's been that's the biggest thing is, and, and this is not even political. This is more of a thing because we, we we look at CF Moto, perfect example. You could build every single one of those things here. Yes, you could. Absolutely. Toyota and Honda and Hyundai and Kia and Air and Volkswagen. Volkswagen's huge. Toyota ba- built its reputation yeah. of quality on the Camry. And the Camry, during that period, was made in America. Absolutely. By American workers. And Toyota built... You the- think of it as a Japanese car, but you're, 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 everybody pictures well, the Camry being the, built in Japan. It wasn't. The most... The best Camrys were built here. Yeah. The most American vehicle, because car and driver does this, I think, every year. They say the most American vehicle is the Toyota Tundra. And in literally every component of that is built in the United States. Well, I, my Tundra had a sticker on it that said 98% United States yeah. built. Right? And <clears throat> in Saint, San Antonio, Texas. You know, yeah, whatever. and you look at a lot of American companies and they're like, well, we're going to shift our manufacturing overseas because it's cheaper to build it overseas and ship it back. Mm-hmm. Whereas the Japanese, not any longer, and the Koreans, not any longer, uh, and the Germans, they were starting to pull. Even when I was when I was working in plastics oh, yeah. manufacturing for a while, they were starting to figure that out. They were like, yeah. "Oh well, you know, our model is we're going to have the tooling made in Venezuela, yeah, and we're going to have it gone, you know." But then they started figuring out, well, like, yeah, well, after you had it made in Venezuela and shipped here and done that, then when something's yeah. wrong, what do you do? Ship it back to Venezuela to have yeah. re- exactly re- rework it? No, then then you're taking it to a local machine shop, right? And they don't give a fuck about you because you didn't give them the contract to build the three hundred dollar exactly. thousand dollar tool in the first exactly. place. Exactly, and it it might have been this whole shakedown thing over the past thirty years of everybody finally realizing no, it actually is more economical to build it in the United States. Or worse yet, since you outsourced everything, now the shops here aren't there. Yeah, so now you're really fucked. That's also true. That is very true, right there. Or <laughs> like the small shops just hung on enough just to keep stuff going, but the rest of the world has advanced so much that exactly. all of our shops are fucking antiquated, anyways. Exactly. You know? I go into my friend's house. We're tearing down uh, my my friend's house. He built the house in '79. He built it himself with his family, and uh, ten acres of property in Michigan. They dated horses. They you know they have bored horses there and everything else and. He's a guy worked at Chrysler Plymouth. So he worked at Chrysler Plymouth. He worked there his whole life. One of the nicest guys you're ever going to meet. Super sweet guy. And he built this house in 79. And the whole family is all 
scattered around this one particular lake about 35 miles west of Detroit, right? And there's beautiful, clear lake, Michigan. And he's got this fun house, you know, this cool house that he built to raise his kids in. And he's got the barn for the horses. And he's got the, the three beautiful daughters. He's got the beautiful wife. They build the house. The family builds the house. They've got a builder guy. They got a this guy. They got a plumber guy. They got an electrical guy. I can tell you they didn't have a fucking architect guy because this house is ah. a fucking <laughs> labyrinth. It's very confusing. Uh, my nightmare would be to be a firefighter and come to the front door of that house if it was on fire and be like, there's a kid in the downstairs basement. Go find him. I couldn't find the. I tried three times. I couldn't find the downstairs bedroom. Uh, but anyway, I digress. Hmm. The guy always had cool stuff, right? Took the family on trips. He had good union money his whole life, right? That's his job. He went into that job. When he was in high school, he knew he was going to have that job. And he retired from that job, okay? He's lived a really, the guy's been doing great. And he's in 74 years old now and stuff's getting away from him. He can't take care of the property anymore. Nature's taking it back from him, right? The horses aren't there anymore. Nature's taking it back from him. His 73 CJ Jeep is in the garage and nature's taking it back from him. His 70 or his 85 Jeep Grand Wagoneer or 83, mm. 85 Wagoneer, absolutely top of the range. <laughs> I love Wagoneer. That he had yeah. his, oh, yeah. that was his tow vehicle for his camper so he could take his family across America on vacations. That's there. I, I got had, pictures of it. I had two of them at one point. Mother Nature's taking that shit back, oh. right? And people are all like, oh. <gasps> It's a wood paneled blue oh, yeah. wagoneer. Yep. Leather, I had, leather. I had leather. Some, some every of, option. I had two of them. I love them. Power. Some, somebody needs to help him out. We're all trying. We were Good. there. I spent two weekends ago there and I was there last weekend. We're all the Jedi Knight Scooter Club is coming together to help him out, right? Because he's in rocking a hard spot, right? Nature's taking away his property. So we burned countless tons of stuff last time we were there. There's dumpsters there. But we're basically taking, you know, an American's ability to obtain shit. Right. The family's to the winds now. He's on his own. His one daughter, our friend Kyle, is there helping out. And we're all coming together, trying to help out any way we can. We love the guy dearly. I'm going through all this stuff. Right. And as we're going through all this stuff, originally he was resistant because he knows what he paid for that. Yep. And he doesn't want to see you throw it in the garbage because yep. he paid for that. He worked yep. hard those hours of labor. I found a, a hair, hair trimmers. Right. Because, you know, and so these hair trimmers are there. Oster, Cleveland, Ohio. Yep, sure. With all the trimmers, all the accessories, everything. In a box, wrapped up. Ah, what the hell? Plug it in. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Like the day it was built, right? Yep. Perfect fucking manufacturing. Heavy as shit. When I go into my barber's here in Cleveland... He's got three or four of these things. Yep. They are prized possessions. He has the rebuild kits to rebuild the brushes. Yep. Every part of that thing is replaceable and has a part number. It was not meant to be disposable. It was meant to be expensive, but high quality. It was a barber's standard. The fact that that device that was built, no shit, by my father, and my father graduated high school in 1959 Wow! and immediately went to work at the Oster factory in Cleveland, Ohio. So I know that that 1959 set of hair trimmers dated on the box was when my father was working at Oster <laughs> Goodness! for gracious. his first manufacturing job he ever had in his life. And he became a machinist and tool and die man. Right. And we think about the live, the, that 1959 product that was bought at retail in 59 that was still completely serviceable today it is the opposite of a disposable economy yep yeah right it is the opposite of a zongshen 450 cc motorcycle that you go eh, you know when it blows up it blows up that's fine you know i got eight years out of it that's gonna get another one it's the opposite of that it yeah. really is and when i see when i see that ktm puts a notice out that says hey you know all of our 790 motors uh oh. Um, <laughs> we've had a problem. They're not. They're not doing well. They're not chooching. We're having cam failures, right? And to avoid or to help put off doing the recall that they should do, because prior to testing the motor enough, they put the motor into the hands of the public. 
because they wanted to capitalize on profit, right? Now they're saying any mode, any owner, if you have one, if you have a KTM 790, by all means, take it to your dealership and they're going to get you the service and support that you need. Please don't say the word recall. Let's try to avoid being forced to fix our fuck up. Let's try to do it on the cheap where the 60% or 80% of people aren't going to get the memo when they're not going to put the miles on their bike and they're not going to experience the failure. Because if you've got a motor that's only been out in the public for four or five years and you tell me it's okay, we've only had a couple of failures. But then you also say anybody that has one has every right to bring one in and we'll take care of it for free. That tells me that the other shoe hasn't dropped yet. That's what that tells me. And then I can pick up a pair of trimmers from 1959 and know that I can get any part inside that housing and rebuild those fuckers. Well, you, you hit, you hit on something right there though. Yeah. Cause you talk about the Auster from 59. Yeah. And the reality is when that was built, Mm -hmm. when the, the base component was built, it was cheaper to build the components to repair the thing than it was to build the thing. You're right, 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 right. And right. because so, of 40 yeah. years or yeah. 60 years of advancement, however you want to go, yeah. it is now cheaper to build a replacement for the thing than it is to build the original thing. Which kind of is, is kind of the downfall of our society as being a replaceable society. We no longer fix anything. Hey, okay. Uh, you Anybody know, sitting at this table? Some of the stuff isn't fixable, though. That's, I mean, like right. your, well, your TV. Okay, you got a TV. Right. You know, maybe there was a point when there was a tube TV where you could work on it and everything. Oh, yeah. But once you start going to solid state or like LCD or boards mm-hmm. and stuff, it just doesn't work. Oh, it's no. just, it work. It's not meant to ever be re- repaired. It, it is not economical. I have plenty of friends. Because I can repair that TV. That but that TV. Enough. I fixed, I've replaced this. Oh, yeah. I've opened my, I've replaced my screen, my oh. digitizer. I've, I've worked on cell phones, a so, number of them. And to some extent, yes, you can. Right. But for the most part, not. Re- I mean, it, I'm. Nobody wants. Nobody's going to gonna rebuild. It's you not, can't fix a broken digitizer. You can't fix a, a. If something's wrong on a board, you can replace boards. You can replace some of the components. Right, but right. Well, but by is, a large, a lot of the stuff. But, I mean, okay, when you get that, into electronics. The TCL, the TCL right there. Right. The Creative Life. It's, it's TCL. That's a two hundred dollar television. Exactly. Right. But I mean, maybe if, if anything if it, goes wrong in it, yeah. you can fix it. But it will but cost it more it. in well, labor so to let, fix it. So. How many TV repair shops do you see anymore? Exactly. Up and down the street. Exactly. Right, because it's a $200 TV. You'd have to right. charge $200 to exactly. fix it to buy a new TV. Transistorized radios will never catch on. <laughs> My washing machine's going bad. <laughs> right. The part to fix it is $250. Oh. And I'm not, I'm going to, I'm going to, I have, no, I'm going to buy a new washing machine. Have, when it, when it re- no longer will run, I will buy a new washing machine. I have rebuilt. Give me your old one. I have rebuilt washing You're more machines. You can have it right now. You can have it right now. I have rebuilt washing machines out of spite. <laughs> I've, I have too. And I've, and I learned a lesson from that. Just buy a new fucking nah, washer. Actually, our, yeah, who are you hurting? You're one, of our manu- <laughs> one of our manufacturers that we deal with is dealing with a warranty claim for one of our customers. And this motorcycle is a Chinese motorcycle. Oh, okay. And the customer is experiencing a failure or experienced a failure. And the customer says, you know, hey, the bike's still under warranty. I have every right to have the running bike, I paid for it and I have a warranty and took it to the dealer. And the dealer said, yeah, you know, you're right. This motor's not, this motor's fucked. Um, you have, you're the buyer. You paid money for it. You have a warranty. You have every right to have a running motorcycle. Every right. Call the manufacturer. Say, hey, manufacturer, um, this thing's fucked. Uh, motor's fucked. It's, it's just fucked. And manufacturer would normally, and I can tell you because I've dealt with this company for years, historically speaking, when we've got a motor that's fucked, the crank is fucked, piston's not going up and down the way it should. The only discussion is, you know, this guy's got the warranty. Send me, you know, it's always hilarious. They want a picture. Okay, here's a picture of a non-running motor. Dumb, dumb <laughs> All right. Show me the thing that I know you arrived. guys are laughing, but I promise if you work in a motorcycle know, shop, you will know. Can you send me a video of it not running? <laughs> Dude, they want us to send a photograph of bikes that make weird noises. Yeah. Okay. They want us to send a photograph of bikes that ship us, ship to us missing a component. Uh-uh. Can you take a picture of the part that's not there? I'll get right on that. Okay. Uh, Look at your phone right true. now. It's there. It's all true. <laughs> right. 
for the, the fact the factory fucked up and didn't put any mirrors in the box. You you've you've prepped you've prepped oh, yeah. Benelli's, yeah. right? The factory fucked up and didn't put any mirrors in the box. Okay, I need mirrors. I'm doing a warranty claim. Right? Send us a picture. Of what? Of the missing mirrors. You did you just say that? Here they are. <laughs> did you just <laughs> say that? See, that's my hand and there's no mirrors. Did in you it. just say that with your mouth? Because fucking hell. <laughs> But here's my, there's the point of the story. This point of the story is I know for a fact, every time I've ever heard of this particular motor, this particular company having a bad motor, they cheerfully mail you a motor in a box. Mm. Okay. Why? Because it's a Chinese bike and the motor that's in the bike is not worth paying my shop $90 an hour to open the motor, find the offending part, take a picture of the offending part, send it to you. And have you send me a replacement for the offending part so that I can put that motor back together again, three hours apart, four hours together, seven hours at 90 to $120 an hour for labor. Now I'm 900 in this fucking box with shipping plus shipping. So maybe a thousand, maybe 1100 bucks. Well, nobody, no manufacturer is going to pay you $1,100 for a motor that they could get in a crate from China for 299 bucks. Yippers. Except for what? Oh. Now, oh. top of the door. Get good news, folks. Top of the morning. They don't have the motors in the boxes. Oh. oh. So, we may have hit a point. They're on the shelf with the mirrors that aren't there. <laughs> That's right. Well, okay. So if you think, hey, how bad could it be if I buy a KTM 790 and the KTM 790's got a fucked crank? They're just going to put another motor in my KTM 90. Unless they don't have the motors for your KTM 790. In which case, you're going to deal with somebody on the other end of the phone who knows he doesn't have any motors to send you. Do they have a crank? Now what's he going to do? So I don't have a motor to send you, but I do have a box of cranks. Uh, yeah. Okay. Now, you've been on the, both sides of this. Mm -hmm. If you come in and, I, and you say, motor bad, warranty good, get me motor. Okay, I know the time it's going to take me is three to five days to get your motor. It's going to take me a day or two to put it in, test drive, right, to make sure everything's good. You're probably going to have your bike back in two weeks. If I am told by the manufacturer after fucking nine days of back and forth, if he finally admits to me that he doesn't have any motor in boxes, and the reason he's having me tear this shit down to the crank is so I can prove to him which part is bad, and he can send me iron crank, iron gasket kit, Iron head gasket, etc. He sends me that bill of parts. Sends that to me. How long is it going to be until customer has running bike again? Mm. Probably a really fucking long time. Probably most of the goddamn summer, if I know what I know about shipping, etc. And the stupid thing is, you know, the Chinese scooter motor yeah. is two ninety nine, so it makes sense. Yep. The Chinese motorcycle motor is two ninety nine. Right. The four fifty motorcycle. However, motors. however, the KTM yeah. motor, which yeah. is still made in China, yeah. is twelve hundred dollars, and they don't want to. You know, they don't want to come off of that, even though it shouldn't be. It should just be a, right. it's not, you know what I mean? Like they're. Well, I'm, I had to hand build a Kimco 200 motor one time. Because the KTM because still. Kimco doesn't do that. The KTM. Uh, I had, Tom. Yeah. I had to fucking hand build seven Moto Guzzi motor 1200s. <laughs> exactly. 1200 Moto Guzzi motors. So don't tell me about your single cylinder oh, no. air-cooled fucking that's Kimco. The, that's the thing. When I got valves going everywhere <laughs> and I got head gaskets all over the fucking place and I got seven different heads to choose from. Eight different gaskets. Got to match every goddamn thing by Thanks. looking for an unobtainable, unvisible yep. mark on a crank. Yep. To make sure part A doesn't go with part Z. And that's the that's the real truth. Can of hold this oil. Is, as a manufacturer, why the hell don't you just have a stash of motors? <laughs> Let's get into that for a second because that's one of the topics. Because we they're not talk because about KTM today. is not the manufacturer. Yeah. KTM is buying those bikes from a company in China. Right. Well, and the company in China probably has a stack of motors, but they can't send them well, straight to it's the company you. that's building BMWs and Yamahas right. and everything else, right? So like, let's talk for just a brief high, second yeah. about Pure Mobility AG. Okay. Here pure we go. Mo Mobility AG is a, a little company you might not have ever heard of uh, called KTM. But they're not just KTM. It's KTM. It's Husqvarna. It's gas gas, it's MV Augusta, and it's WP suspension. It's all coming out of one building, okay? But they've had kind of a bad week, or a bad month, or maybe a bad year. In fact, how bad has their year been? 
Their year's been so bad that even those assholes that have the briefcases of money they have to take home every night have had to get fired. Hmm. Out of their C-suite of eight multimillionaires, six of them are unemployed right now. So There's only two them. left. Okay. How will they ever make the rent? <laughs> you may remember about three months ago on our podcast where we talked about them cutting 373 people out of their staff yeah. in order to stay in business. Now, I do want to remind you that this is the same KTM that signed a sweetheart deal with CF Moto and has been building a shit ton of bikes in China. In fact, a lot of the KTMs and the motors that go in them are made in China. And that's what saved the company because they have their flagship model to 1290s and all their good adventure bikes that are still European, but they're paying the bills with a shit ton of light duty, lightweight, cheap and cheerful bikes that have what we call a profit margin because the bikes are made in China. That's absolutely all true. Well, 373 people were laid off or fired. Laid off means you're probably going to come back to work, um, but this probably isn't. They uh, they called those human beings that worked their redundancies. You could say that again. Right? <laughs> By the way, these redundancies were decided that they were redundant because they were $1,469 million in debt. It's $1.5 billion in debt. This is the company that's been bragging about how great they've been doing since they signed a deal with CF Moda. Well, which newspaper article are you going to read? They're doing really great since they signed the deal with CF Moda and they're pumping out all these 390s and pumping all these 410s and pumping out all the 490s and the 790s and making quite a good stink about those things. But the long and short of it is they're <clears throat> doing so great that they're $1.5 billion in debt. They've first in the first quarter got rid of 373 of their people. And now they're getting rid of an additional 300 people. Um, this is that building. And maybe we might wonder why they're $1.6 billion in debt and that their factory is producing 10% of what they used to produce in Europe. And they're producing 90% of what they sell in China. That's tough. That's difficult. Stefan Perrier, the CEO, and Gottfried Neumeister as the co-CEO, they're still there. You know, they're there. But in one sentence, I'm going to point out two lies. However, the available registration data for the overall mar motorcycle market in the United States for the period from January to September shows a decline of 6.3%. You guys read that, right? It's written right there. Mm -hmm. So that means over a nine-month period, they show a decline of 6.3%. Next line. September was also the weakest month since January 2024 with a decline of 14.6%, meaning that a rapid recovery cannot be expected. That's called the writing on the wall. That means it's not a, it's not a burp. It's not a temporary loss. It's not going away. But if you tell me as a shareholder or whoever, that we've had a decline of 6.3% over the past nine months. If you follow that up by telling me that you've had a 14.6 decline in just September, that doesn't math. That doesn't work. Those are two statements that are fighting against each other. And that's why in the UK alone, they have closed 28 privately owned motorcycle dealerships. And the UK is not big enough to use a number like that. Not, I'm sorry, not the UK, England. And in England, they've lost 28 independent motorcycle dealerships. I keep seeing on Facebook a lot of Harley dealerships closing yep. all around here. We're I've gonna seen talk like about four that. or five, four We're or five talk about that. Yep. We're going to talk about that because this is something that people should be aware of. If you're out there and you want to be aware of the motorcycle market and what it is, Windy City, Chicago. Windy City, Chicago has six Harley Davidson dealerships. Pretty heavy saturation. Um, they, they might have something to do with a company here in Cleveland called Rock and Roll Harley Davidson. Hmm. 
They have just closed out of their six stores in just the past nine months. They've closed three of them. Mm-hmm. It's a lot of jobs. It also means a lot of people that own Harley Davidsons have to go real far to get their bikes serviced. Okay. So out of six, closed three, including one of them in Wisconsin that has now gone to a summertime only format. So if you want your motorcycle to be worked on between September 30th and uh, April 1st, for you're fucked. It's closed. If you, if you want to hear the, if you want to see the craziest thing you've ever seen, Google Harley David, Davidson dealerships closing. I did that for you. We're about to get to that. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Titusville, Florida yep. has a population of 600,000 people in their region, in their market. They just closed their largest Harley Davidson dealer. Been there for quite a while. Okay. Uh, San Francisco's Harley Davidson dealership that's been in business for 110 fucking years. Yep. Just closed. Same family. 110 years. Dealership is now closed. A uh, uh, Kansas... Kansas dealer since 1977, Harley Davidson dealer just closed. See what happens when you go woke. <laughs> that is actually <laughs> one of the responses I saw earlier for closing these you Harley can, Davidson. You can dealerships. try to blame this all on going woke, going brown, yeah. but I can ain't. I can blame it on some other things. I, I can blame it on a couple other things. So if if this this is Halloween, but this is horrifying. Yeah. This is scary. These are scary things because I can't remember in my lifetime at any period when so many motorcycle dealerships have gone out of business. But we just talked about the number of... 2010 was bad. Well, it's... 2010 was bad. I lost a lot of people in my dealer organization in 2010. Yeah. A lot yeah. of people. That was a, a bad year. But okay. you're, you're talking about a company that has had a record number of, um, what do you call it, uh, default on loans. Yep, absolutely. Well, and because for, hey, for bike loans. When you let people buy houses that aren't qualified to buy houses, yeah. you have a problem in the housing market. Some, when you let people buy motorcycles that aren't qualified to buy motorcycles, you have yeah. a problem in the motorcycle market. So you've had this huge shrinkage. Mm-hmm. And so, so what's the source of the issue here? Well, the source of the issue is a couple of things. Well, the first thing is um, Harley Davidson did flood their own market. Yeah. And Harley Davidson did during pandemic um, cash in on the fact that people had stimulus checks. They cashed in on the fact that people were working from home and wanted to ride motorcycles. They leaned heavy into it. They wrote a shit ton of paper. Yep. And they don't have a good method for getting that paper back. They don't have a good method for getting those bikes. People defaulted on those loans back in. And a lot of those loans were written to Harley Davidson. They're self-financed. Yeah. So when you have uh, when you have something like GMAC too big to fail. Yep. I ju- I wonder about Harley Davidson. Is somebody going to step up to try to rescue Harley Davidson? Right now, the dealers are the ones feeling the pinch. The dealers yeah. are the guys who are saying, "You're telling me that I need to order 296 motorcycles for next year. I'm telling you, I still have 180 on my floor." that I owe juice on at 14% a month or 18% a this month is, or 28% a month. I can't pay for the ones that are already here. I'm going to put, I'm going to make myself bankrupt on bikes that are already here. My projected sale service numbers I need to maintain because every dealer has it. Those bikes aren't coming in. The bikes that were in here three years ago, getting oil changes and tires put on and everything else, they're not here anymore. Those bikes aren't coming in. Every element of the shop, whether it's their retail, their clothing and accessories, that's all dropped down to nothing. It's their retail sales themselves of units, that's dropped down to nothing. Their service is dropped down to nothing. They're running with these buildings that Harley Davidson forced them to get. Yeah. Rock and roll Harley Davidson, which we've all been there, it is a giant fucking building. It is a giant oh, yeah. place. It replaces Smitty's. Smitty's Harley Davidson on West, 140th. West 140th that, Rain. And that building has been for sale. For at least a year. The building itself. Ooh, the building, Rock and Roll Harley Davidson has been for sale for a year. That right, building. Right. So you can buy the building, but you have a 100-year lease. Mm-hmm. So they are looking for somebody to buy out the equity yep. just so they can stay in lo- uh, stay alive. To pay rent. Yeah. To pay rent. They want to pay rent to somebody to own the building, but they're going to pay it back with the money you buy it for. 
it's a weird equity swap that I don't, I'm not real estate savvy enough to understand, but I get it. <laughs> we see, um, you guys went to see, you guys went to visit Ducati and Ducati's part of Ray Hall and the dealer, our, our dealer friend in Indianapolis, who's, uh, all the lines, you know, full, full multi-line dealership is Ray Hall. And I got a call from them the other day talking about, you know, how their business is going and what's going on there. And every single dealer I'm talking to, it's fucking October, nearly November. And everybody has about 80% more bikes on the floor than they want to, hmm. which is, you know, really great for Wells Fargo and their multiple wow, you know, it, increasing N interest on the flooring. NPA is going to be real busy next year. Really, Tom? Yeah. Who's going to oh, buy them? I know. That's the problem. Or is NPA going away? Mm. Can NPA can NPA afford to stay in business not selling bikes? Because I look at the NPA list, and it's getting ridiculous. National Power Sports Auction. It's what happens when your dealership can't sell the bikes you have on the floor, and the interest on those bikes is untenable. When you can't pay your interest on the bikes you have on your floor, good example would be, let's just say you have 200 bikes on your floor, and the interest on those bikes for those 200 bikes that you have there that have been there for more than 90 days, your interest on those 200 bikes is something along the lines of $20,000 a month. That's just the interest. If you're not selling enough retail, if you're not selling enough new units to have an extra $20,000 to just pay the juice on the other 200 bikes that are on your floor, you are going to go out of business in the fastest way possible, wow. the worst way possible. 25 and 26 are going to be totally the years to buy bikes. Probably. Yeah. <laughs> that means the manufacturer is probably going to send a truck. They're probably going to pick those bikes up. And because they don't want to bring those bikes back into their inventory in their warehouse, they're going to send them to NPA and NPA is going to liquidate those. I've been there. I've been there before. Yep. Those bikes are going to sell at a fraction. Now keep in mind, the bank got paid all that extra interest for all those months that those banks were there. Those bikes were there. Wells Fargo is not losing any money on this deal. The bikes themselves are going to go to NPA. NPA is going to say, we are going to keep a percentage of what they sell for. Because that's how auctions work. So NPA is going to make a lot of money on that deal. But who are they going to sell them to? What dealers are going in there with pockets full of money on a bike that they can't floor? You know, you go and buy a two-year-old Harley Davidson, you go and buy a two-year-old Ducati that has zero miles on it, you're not walking into the same situation where you've got 180 days, 120 days to pay for it. NPA needs to be paid within 30 days. So you got to have cash up front. You got to be able to swing that sweet ass deal on the brand new Harley Davidson that would be $18,000 and you're buying it for 11. But how many dealers are going to show up at these auctions? How many dealers are going to show up and be there for that once a month auction where I used to go in there and there'd be 200 guys, 300 guys. The other day they had an auction, there were 26 guys there. Now you can't do that. You can't sell 5,000 bikes to 26 guys. It doesn't work. And the building only holds so many bikes. So sooner or later, the bottom's going to drop out in that situation. I'm guessing it's going to be sooner. As I see more and more and more stories about Kawasaki, Suzuki, and Yamaha dealers that are going out of business. A friend of mine just got contracted to pick up 45 boats from a Yamaha Power Sports dealer that went default on their flooring. You know, boat, Yamaha boats, they yeah. come in various different oh, yeah. sizes. And he's picking up these boats and taking them away from the dealership and taking them to a, a storage yard because Yamaha wants their boats back or Wells Fargo wants their boat by, boats back. Who, I'm not quite whoever sure. Whoever financed it, it, yeah. But that's gotta, yeah. 45 boats. And last time I checked, there wasn't any boat you could buy for less than $10,000. So I know for a fact that's a half a million dollars worth of inventory. Now somebody has to pay the truckers to move all that. This is not going to go well. Yeah, that's like, how many boats fit on a fucking truck? Two? If you're Three? lucky. Yeah. Well, yeah. That's a well, lot. These of, are the, it's it, a lot of logistics. It money. depends yeah. on which, what kind of boat it is. Because from the small boat with a trailer to the large boat that needs a specialized trailer. Going out of broken This is cheap. all, yeah, no. There's going to be a lot of sunk costs in this. Yep. And it's not just the cost of the vehicle itself. It's the logistics of moving it around. Up on the screen right now, I got a little company you may have never heard of called BRP. Bombardier. Yeah. Right? Bombardier. Okay, what do they do? 
Well, everything. They do snow, right? They literally they do, do everything. <clears throat> Bombardier. We've heard, you've heard of a ski do. Yep. Right. We all know about ski do's. Probably the brand you would most recognize when it comes to snow machines, right? Mm-hmm. So we know that. Yay. They have a down market um, uh, links. Okay. Uh, what about Can Ams? Yep. We've all heard of Can Ams. Too many wheels on your motorcycle? Yep. Or you got an ATV, side by side, quads, that kind of shit. Right. Well, they used to make the dopest dirt bikes back in the day, too. They're bringing those back in the form of electric motorcycles. Oh, sweet. Okay. Yeah. K&M's coming back with new shit. You mm. may have heard of a sea in your life. Yep. Right? You heard of a sea uh, n- Not, you know, not a short time ago. They got into other things other than sea They have a boat company called Lumacraft, right? Fishing boats. If you're, if you're familiar with fishing boats, you know about Lumacraft. Manitou are their party barges. Right, they do all the party barges, all the uh, um, pontoon boats. <laughs> yep. Quintrex is another thing. Quintrex is a, a family fishing boat, right? And these are actually these were uh, offshore. These are for Australian market and things like that. Okay? Sounds, sounds like a medicine. Quintrex. It does Quintrex? <laughs> yeah. Okay, so all your physician. <laughs> we all feel pretty good about. <laughs> yeah, we Bombardier's company well, that Bombardier. I mean, they've they right. they build planes. It's just like it, Piaggio. It, they build planes. They build they planes. Build everything up to planes. Exactly right. The CRJ is like the pinnacle of airplanes for small commuter jets. They're not feeling so good these days. Yeah. They're selling off their entire Marine division. So by selling off, I guess if you can find a buyer, that's great. I don't know anybody's... I mean, I'm sure somebody's going to step up and buy something for pennies on the dollar. But, but with the diversity of these products, it mm-hmm. seems like they bought up smaller companies to become part oh, of them. Absolutely. So are they just releasing these companies back to the market? Probably? I don't think they're releasing them back to the guys they bought them from. No, 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 no. no. But I'm saying, like, right. if somebody buys them, are they just buying basically back the good comps- friend of mine, Yeah, a good friend of mine a few years ago said, you know what? I've had enough. I think we've, I've been doing this for 30 years. And uh, I think I'm going to sell my shop. I said, that's cool. That's great. That's nice that you've had. It's nice you've said those words. Do you have a buyer in mind? Because if there's not somebody to step up and buy the thing you're selling, no. you're going to own it for a really fucking long time. Mm-hmm. Or you're going to do what 90% of motorcycle shops that I've ever met in my life do. You hold an auction. Yeah. And you sell it down to the goddamn walls for pennies on the dollar. And then you sell the building. And that's your exit strategy. I've never known anybody in my life, and I know probably 300 motorcycle dealers, owner operators. I've never known anybody who went in and bought a motorcycle dealership. We start them. We build them because we love them. We don't buy them and we damn sure don't sell them. We run them. We put our heart and soul into it. We hire and fire many people over the 30 years that we run them. And then we try to have that pipe dream that we're going to sell it. And we put it up and we list it and we never find the guy who steps up and goes, yeah, I got $3.5 million in my pocket. I'm going to look for a business that's been proven to be a very low profit margin business. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and a lot of headaches. I'd like to slowly go broke over the next yep. 30 years. Yep. Right. And have the maximum amount of headaches. Right. I'd like to have one guy on a test ride, break his back and take it all away from me. Right. That's the kind of risk I want in my life. Do you want a pension? Not in my line of work. Mm -hmm. Do you want a retirement fund? Hope you're good with your money. Mm -hmm. Do you want a 30% return on your investment? (laughs) Not in this industry, right? No way, man. No way. When you say they're going to put that Alumacraft boat company back into the market. Yeah. Well, if you don't have a buyer standing by to purchase Alumacraft boats, you're about to auction off a whole bunch of Alumacraft boats. Because the the only thing It's called liquidation. The only thing there for Mm -hmm. Alumacraft is... The name of Lumacraft, which nobody knows, but I would just, and the intellectual property owned by Lumacraft, which nobody cares about. But the, I think the big difference, though, here though, is that like if you're talking about any of the normal motorcycle size dealers that mm-hmm. you're talking about, I don't think they have the same like circle of investor friends that KTM might have, or like or these guys. Like <laughs> well, you're know absolutely I'm, right. You know, yeah. So like, you know, like that might be a thing where like they're like James, weren't you looking to pick up a business? Yeah. Well, I, you know, I'm getting rid of a Lumacraft. You, you know, kind of a thing. You look at so. you look at a Lumacraft. Mm-hmm. Just saying. Okay, for perfect example, you look at CF Moto. Well, no, QJ that bought Benelli. And you look, they bought Benelli only as a name because there's nothing of Benelli about Benelli's. There is no three and a half or five and a quarter 
Benelli anymore. It is literally just a CJ motor sold as a Benelli or as a Harley Davidson half. Yeah, they bought the badge. Right, they bought the badge. Right. So the question becomes, is Lumacraft enough of a name for Bombardier to sell off to CF Motor or QJ as the Alumacraft boat? Oh, I see what you're saying. So yeah. then they pick up the manufacturing right. and just exactly. slap it on whatever it shitty is, thing they already have. Yeah. Gotcha. Well, yeah. no, it's Anergica, not even that. Anergica, the company that we we had the bikes, yeah. they, they tried real hard to make us a dealer. And Energica, the Italian electric motorcycle company that did the whole e-racing, you know, the, the, the zero GP that was going to be the source of electric motorcycle racing for all of Europe. They put together an entire race team, um, you know, f- the whole Ducati electric motorcycle thing. And everybody was like, this is going to be great. It's going to be amazing. Uh, Energica just within the past 14 days said, Arrivederci, we're gone. They're oh, done. really? Yeah. And it's not like, well, you know, we're going to take a timeout. Mm. It's not we're going to lay off half of our staff. They're fucking done. Yeah. It's over. It's over. Um, but people who pay attention knows that a couple, three years ago, they were purchased by a company called Ideanomics, mm. which is the uh, World Wrestling Federa- Federation guy's son, Sean uh, McMahon. Okay. Mm. And when I heard about that, that, that thing, I was like, what the fuck does this guy know about the motorcycle industry? Squatoosh. Nothing. And has this guy ever bought anything that's turned into a lot of money? He's just got money. He's got a shit ton of money. And when people have a shit ton of money, you can buy a dumb thing and lose money on it for five years. Right. That you take all your winnings from your other companies that are profit heavy and you dump them into this (gasps) turd. And you lose money here for five years, and that one goes out of business. But good news, you didn't pay any taxes on the other ones. Yep. You win. So not shockingly, Energica goes away. At the exact same time Energica is going away, Zero Electric Motorcycle Company in the United States picks up an extra $107 million in a funding round from investors, including Polaris and Hero Motorcycle Corporation in India. Hmm. Might be the one to watch. Which, considering the number of dealers they've lost, is really surprising. I thought I just read an article that said Polaris is the, in the same boat. They're losing big time. I'm about oh, yeah. to, we're about to go into that. This is where we're going. We're about to go into that. <laughs> so, that $107 million, I, load, I noticed when I said $107 million, nobody at this table went, fuck, that's a lot of money. Because we've become numb to it. We have. We've become numb to it. But that round of funding that I talked about from Polaris and Hero in India, the largest motorcycle company on the planet, they're investing in zero. But what I didn't tell you about was the round of funding that they got two weeks ago. That was $454 million. Oof. Now eyebrows are going. Now, up. Yeah, now we're raising That's eyebrows. Well, it's a half bill altogether, right? right? You have <clears throat> my attention. Yeah. In this market. You had my interest, and now you have my attention. We we should be aware of the fact that that company in California that's selling electric motorcycles, in a market where other electric motorcycle companies, pretty much fucking every one of them in electric ever said, this is the new thing in electric yeah. motorcycles, yeah. they've all gone away. Yeah. Right? I sent that one Go time. ride your Sondors. Yeah. Right? I, I dare you. But Zero Motorcycles just picked up $454 million at a time when Harley-Davidson is closing an astronomical number of dealers. Livewire what? Livewire what exactly? Livewire who? 100% of Livewires have been recalled. That's uh, 321 bikes. And <laughs> they just got a grant for how many millions of dollars? All of when when we're paying the bills for Livewire, no, it's not a part of Harley Davidson. But when they get a grant from the U.S. government for sixty eight million dollars, oh yeah, that's totally Harley Davidson. Livewire, yeah, that's that's us. That's us. Absolutely, you're catching that grant money. That's us. I'm gonna tell you, this is a little, this is a little bit telling. Man, late stage capitalism kind of sucks. <laughs> well, <laughs> it it does make you wonder. Polaris, who is having some really bad times right now, Polaris is 
shedding weight like motherfucker at yep. the moment. But the last big thing I remembered them buying was giving up a hundred million dollars to zero because Polaris was going to have a lot of their ATVs and power equipment being electric, oh, not yeah, gasoline powered did anything. That. They produced it. It's there. Yeah. You can go buy one yeah. right now. Right? It's there. You can't say like this might happen. It fucking happened. It's already there. It's at dealers right now. You can go buy it. But Polaris is having a fucking shit day or shit six months, I should say. I want to say that being a motorcycle person in the motorcycle space think- and looking at all this, it is very challenging. And I have to say that when we talk about all of these companies that have made a lot of plans with China, KTM in particular, it ain't looking so good for them right now. These guys are experiencing extreme financial duress. When you went from eight sea level people to down to just two, and when you've laid off almost 600 people, and laid off is an optimistic term, that means you think it's coming back, but those redundancies, when you do that, ask, I, got, I got to think that that's, that's heroic shit. Ask the guys at the AM, AMC factory when they're coming back to work. Yep, yeah. yeah. And, when the, and when all the life preservers are gone, people start fighting over deck chairs, right? And I have to think that at this point, in situations like that KTM thing, uh, that's terrifying. That's terrifying. And if you're a motorcycle dealership in England, if you're a motorcycle dealership where KTM is your life's blood and it's what you really live for, that could be fucking scary. That could be real fucking scary because Alta Motors, you know, they're gone. They don't exist, right? Damon, they're gone. They don't fucking exist. You know, there's a lot of people that we can name. If you go through the motorcycle graveyard, there's a lot of fucking, there's a lot of names in that motorcycle graveyard. And we just keep getting more like, oh, it's Moto Marini. Go out and get your Moto Marini motorcycles. Uh, it's uh, it's go out and get your uh, what's the uh, the one everyone's raving about right now? Aprilia. It's Haljet. <laughs> well, it could be. Ita- exactly. Again, that's that's an Italian name and a Chinese it's product, in. right? In Via Gusta. And Via Gusta. Via Gusta. That's they're forty nine percent. I mean, that's KTM. And that's so. you know, and we're we're talking about the de- we're talking about the shrinkage is the best way I could say mm-hmm. it of electric motorcycles. And the reality is considering the limited mileage that everybody rides their bikes. Mm-hmm. I don't care who you are. You do not ride more than a hundred miles a day. If you do, you're a liar or you're an iron butt rider period. Uh, uh, 20, 25 years of working on motorcycles for people. I can promise you, I have never seen a motorcycle come into my shop with 36,000 miles put on it in a year. Yep. And the reality is, just the doesn't happen. simple fact is, an electric motorcycle should be the easiest thing to transition into. Mm-hmm. You plug it in at night, you mm-hmm. wake up in the morning, yep. you ride your mileage. Yep. Scooter, motorcycle, moped, it doesn't fucking matter. Right. And the hardest thing to launch in this country, or any country for that matter, has been an electric motorcycle. Yeah, because I fucking hate it. Because I, <laughs> I ride an electric motorcycle, and it sucks. I'll you know? tell you something I don't hate that's electric. Yeah. The Tesla Model Y. <laughs> when we were down in Huntsville, Charlie had just purchased a mm-hmm. brand new, only got 800 miles on it, Tesla Model Y. Yep. It was 50 some thousand dollars, but with all the fucking rebates and shit, yeah. Oh, yeah. he took it home for $37,000. Really? Yeah. yeah. Now you have an 800 horsepower yeah. all-wheel drive vehicle yeah. that will drive itself. And it's pretty. I have, and it really looks nice. I, it's a beautiful car. I it's have comfortable. Been, yeah. It's Spartan inside, but it's leather. Pleather. I mean, they, nobody's really leather anymore. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> those are those uh, vinyl cows. There. It yeah. doesn't have a yeah. speedometer. It doesn't you know have a speedometer no- or a gauge Do cluster. Do you know how many knobs? It doesn't have a speedometer or a gauge cluster. It has <laughs> a computer screen in the it, middle of the yep. dash. Oh, absolutely. And and the most beautiful thing about it was. We walked out of some fucking vintage or uh, antiques place or whatever. Mm. I'm like, uh-huh. It's, that'd be cool if your car could just come over and pick us up. He's like, it can. And he pulls out his phone. Oh, yeah. And he hits it. And the car backs out of its spot. Yep. Drives all the way over and pulls right up in front of us by itself. Yep. For $37,000. Yep. I mean, that's about what we paid for our and, Kia. I feel stupid now. And what it has a 300 mile range and it does zero to 60 in four seconds. Yep. 
ludicrous, I think he can unlock it and it'll even go faster. But, <laughs> but why? Okay. I only need to pull enough of my dick out to win. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So if I I did I was in one of these in ludicrous mode and the whole thing and of course paying that extra money to unlock the ludicrous speed <laughs> it it does the first thing you do when you press the isn't button it, is it isn't gives it called the plaid plaid there's a whole plaid yeah car right there's versions of it called the plaid yeah but the first thing that comes up on the screen when you do this is a warning <clears throat> that what you're about to do. This gratuitous display of thrust is going to damage your transmission, your motors, yeah. your drivetrain. Now, I will admit that I drive my Ford with a V8 5 liter like it's connected to my wallet. And for that, I get returned to 20 miles per gallon out of a big ass 4x4 pickup truck. <clears throat> and I pat myself on the back for being frugal. And about once every five or six months, something happens when I have to smash my foot to the floor and use all the 400 horsepower. And when that something happens, I'm thrilled that it's there and it always impresses me with what that thing can do. And I, I just forget that underneath that hood, there's something there that actually has some power because I'm driving the other one that's a V6. And <laughs> I just think that's what they're supposed to be. But da, 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 da. Why, why I think that's important, what they're doing Plaid is just for showing off. I mean, it's already without the plaid part. It's always it's already way oh, the yeah. fuck faster than all, a Buick Lesabre. All the torque it's at zero. Already way the fuck faster than a Porsche, whatever. Mm-hmm. It's only going to be beaten by something else that's electric. Yep. So the plaid thing is just a five thousand dollar Rolex watch that impresses other people, yep. but doesn't get time any better than what I'm wearing. Drivetrain warranty three two hundred thousand miles. <sighs> 15 years or yeah. 200,000 miles on the battery and drivetrain. Maybe that's why he sold 7 million cars. Yeah, yeah. that's why you're seeing a lot of them. I, I always thought it was just people who were eco-conscious. And, right. and then, okay, so his payment's oh, no. 550 bucks a month, right? No gas. Okay. He yep. plugs it in and charges it. He's like, it works out to nine cents to charge it up or yep. something God like that. damn. Yep. And the maintenance on it is 100,000 miles. You yep. take it in, you never get an oil change. Yep. You maybe have to put regular tires on. Nothing special. No, the Brakes, tires go fast. No, they are, they well, are special. Well, no, they're not. They're regular Goodyear or whatever. So, they're, uh, they're not special tires. There's and, a deal with that. I, I will help you out with that just a tiny bit because I, I, I was this close to buying two of them. Yeah. Both the Cybertruck. Not going to happen. No. And uh, X model before that. <clears throat> that why? She's a heavy gal. Yeah. She's heavier. 40, 4,500 pounds. She's heavier than most other. Towing capacity, though, is impressive. Mm-hmm. If you want to tow with it, I don't know how well it's going to last with battery, but whatever. We can tell you because we had some customers that do that. Mm-hmm. And uh, your normal 300-mile range goes down to about 100 miles sure. with a trailer, with a, with a box trailer. Yeah. But the tire thing, they can have a bit of an appetite. It depends on how you drive it, for like anything, you know. Yeah. And they can, and they do make special tires now. For the Tesla type vehicles, yep. all of our Hummers, our Rivians, our stuff like that, Ford F one fifty Lightnings are heavy vehicles, yeah. and so they do they do recommend now um, a heavier duty tire because the vehicle weighs a lot. Okay, brakes last a hundred thousand miles. Oh, oh yeah, I, yeah. Oh yeah. Right. All your all so your service. Maybe components you're going to chew through tires, but, but this. But is, you're never going to have an oil change, and you don't pay you don't pay for gasoline mostly. I mean, he plugs it. He bought. He spent two thousand dollars. And had a guy hook up a, a level three charger in his garage. Yeah. And he says, I plug it in and then that's good for one week of my driving because he doesn't drive. But, th- but this is exactly why a two-wheeled vehicle of any manufacturer, scooter, moped, I don't care, the super bike should be a no-brainer. You got a battery pack, ba- battery pack that'll go whatever mileage you want. A motor that'll do whatever as speed as you can program into it. And two wheels. That's it. There is no maintenance. Charlie said an 80% charge takes 15 minutes. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Supercharger. Oh, yeah. yeah. Superchargers are fast. And it's, it, you know, most people say that you sit down at a gas station. If I didn't have minutes, a soul, I would probably own a zero DSRX. Yeah. But the problem is I do have a soul. And when I look at the motorcycle, it has to be good looking. 
when I ride the motorcycle, it has to get in touch with my my feels. I, the the dual sport one I loved with the beak, mm-hmm. that little one. But the the, the yeah. basically was an X six fifty. The dolphin one was a sexy looking and. Bike. The reality is hmm. the biggest problem with Zero is they kept trying to upgrade the firmware. Leave the fucking thing alone. Just leave it alone. I need a motor and a, and a controller. Right. I don't need all the bullshit. Everyone that we've ever had a problem with. You better get comfortable with yeah. it. Because every, every yeah. new car coming out, yeah. you're not going oh, yeah, no, to be tethered to no, firmware I, I, dr- I, I had a rental Hyundai Sonata in Branson last week. I hated that fucking car. I'm not going to turn this on, but um, <laughs> if you own it, if you go right now to Walmart or wherever, go to the getting spot. Yeah. Get yourself a nice little $149 HP printer just because you need to print some shit. And you know that they've got three or four ink cartridges in it. And we all know that the. You're out of cyan. That per ounce <laughs> printer ink is more expensive than. Uranium Mm. or whatever. But now the deal is with all these is they have this ink for you program that you're going to subscribe to. Whether or not you want to subscribe, if you want to operate the printer, if you want to download the firmware Mm. for the printer for your computer to use the printer, you're going to sign up for this. Chris, I'm going to need a cupcake. Yep. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. And you know what's going to happen is that <laughs> when they predict that you need to buy some ink. Mm-hmm. Bring them all. They're gonna, <laughs> when they predict it's time for you to buy some ink, they're going to charge you for some ink. Yep. So that your printer never runs out of ink. Well, as long as you're paying your yep. twelve ninety nine a month. Yep. Or whatever it is. As long as you're paying for the heated seat you have in your BMW. Yeah. Ink fee. <laughs> So now we got a problem that a lot of people that bought printers that just needed a goddamn printer that hooked it up like they've always hooked up their printer and said, I'll buy ink when I goddamn well need to. And then you buy it on Amazon, you buy the fake ink, and they figured out a way to <sighs> cheat the little chip in it now so it all works. Well, now they don't even, now they figured out a way to beat you on that. So now we have people that are buying printers that are only good for the life of the original ink that you put in it. And when you get down to half on your ink, uh-huh. then HP says, we're going to automatically yep. send you some fresh ink. That you've got a subscription service for your ink on your printer. Companies that have enlisted the promotional... Companies that have enlisted subscription-based services for their products have shown to be between seven and 900% more profitable. Right. Because as much as you might bitch and moan and say, I'm never going to buy a printer that has that sort of a relationship with it, that's you, but your mom's going to go to home or Walmart and buy that printer. And once she buys that printer, she's held hostage. And your mom's not going to have the wherewithal to get super assed up about it and take the printer back to Walmart and write a sternly worded letter and get their hundred dollars back because subscription based things as evil as they are, have proven to be very profitable to the corporations. Now I don't want to live in a subscription based society. Let's going back to, you know, our motorcycles. Well, yeah. Even before that, mm-hmm. all those uh, um, albums that you bought for yeah, Columbia House, baby. Oh yeah, <laughs> oh yeah. Still trying to collect your money. Here we are. Well, that's what I asked you. There I asked are. Charlie. I'm like, and he's like, nope. He's like, once you buy the car, you bought the car. Mm-hmm. The self drive is yours. Everything is yours. You don't, you know, it is what it is. And you can do all kinds of stuff with it through the through the interface. I know. You know. You know. I laugh. I. I. But I pay twelve bucks. I think I pay twelve bucks a month for Spotify. Mm-hmm. But I consume music in an entirely different way than most people do. You know. I don't. I can't just buy an album because every month I would have to buy twenty. And yeah, you know, it's not the same. Yeah. But a lot of people I know are like, no, I listen to the same six albums. But I pay 12 bucks a month to get it. I'm like, you don't need Spotify. <laughs> With, um, when you have that, uh, you know, we, we spent our time. We did more than our fair share of time with Italian electric motorcycles, oh, with God, American yeah. electric motorcycles, with Chinese electric motorcycles. Um, and what I can tell you is that each and every one of them now has gone to subscription-based Ugh, firmware. Which is why they're all failing. And it is why they're failing. It's why a guy that has a relationship with his motorcycle and rides it to work on Tuesday morning goes out 
after his job, turns his bike on, his bike doesn't work. And the bike has worked fine for 5,000 miles up until this point, but now the bike doesn't work anymore. And we've had about three calls, and I'm not a zero dealer anymore. Keep that in mind. I gave them up. I've had about three calls this month from people that have had completely bricked bikes. And due to a lot of other dealers like myself not wanting to be a party to a situation where I have to tell a customer, well, the reason your bike failed is firmware based. And because even though you might not have wanted to do an update to your bike, your bike thought it was time to do an update. And now it's it's changing things that you may not agree with. Yeah. And whereas I know that I used to be able to park a zero on October 1st, and go out to that motorcycle on March 1st and bring it out of the garage, having had it sit unplugged for six months, five months, and the battery only went down 2%. The battery that was parked at 90% was 88%. Jump on the bike, go haul ass. I hope you've had a great winter in Florida. Your bike asked nothing of you. Yeah. You parked it, you rode it, it was great. All those bikes that did that, and for years and years and years, yep. Uh, Steve Hoffert owns a bike that's a perfect example of that. His bike is one of those generations of bikes that its original firmware, the way it was written, he could park that bike on November 1st, not even go out to the garage, just leave it out there. And if he goes out there March 1st, he wants to ride his bike, that battery pack has lost maybe 2 3%. And that's the way Zero used to advertise. Yep. No maintenance on this vehicle over the winter. Zero, remember, zero emissions, zero maintenance. Now, that same exact bike today, not today's version, not the 2024 version of it. No, Steve's bike, Steve's 2017 or whatever it is, his exact bike. If it ever comes into the dealership, my dealership, which it did, and I'm trying to diagnose or I'm trying to give him an update because I want him to have the best possible owner's experience. And I do my job as a dealer and I hook his bike up to my computer. I do not have an option. If I want to do diagnostics on this bike, this bike will be receiving the new firmware. And I cannot choose, I'm sorry, I want firmware version 2 or firmware version 3. If there's firmware version 18.1 right now and that's what's cooking, I'm only able to get version 18.1. That's it. And if version 18.1 is unstable and they don't have the bugs out of it yet, I just put an unproven, unstable firmware into Steve's bike. A customer who's put <clears throat> 9,000 miles on their bike and loves it dearly is now suddenly working with a completely different set of firmware. The bike may accelerate differently. The bike may break differently. The bike definitely will charge differently. It'll have a different level of power consumption, which for a guy like Steve Hoffert is going to drive him insane. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> because he knows to the quarter mile how much range he has on a battery. And if all of a sudden he's getting a different number than that, he's going to insist on knowing the conspiracy theory behind why that changed. Yeah. Right? There's enhanced gravity on its way to work. Oh, it's going go to the, it's gonna go due to the space that. station on the moon. But the reality right? is, reality is, as crazy and whack alone as that all sounds, it's not wrong. Because you've taken a proven system that has worked. It has worked consistently since 2017. Absolutely. And you have Fucked it up. Absolutely. You have completely fucked it up. And that was my problem with Zero is that you've taken a perfect system, which is literally if I turn this, it turns that. It did. And the battery charges. It sure did. And there is no Wi Fi involved in this entire fucking yep. process. It sure and did. And you fucked it up. Yep. You have fucked me as a customer and you have yep. fucked your product up. Well, <laughs> that's that point where we are starting to fuck? we're starting to cross the line between do I own this property? Yeah. Or am I just paying for this property? But also, we are of a different time where our motor, like, we come from, we expect bikes to do this, that, mm -hmm. and that. And not having them do that or have to wait for them to do something or deal with right. this, we're like, ah. But if you're like a 22 year old kid that's grown up with like his fucking crib had updates, mm -hmm. yeah. You know what yeah. I mean? Like, that's probably not even a you thing. Know, They're just you like, know, oh, it's, you got to update it, it, man. It didn't dawn on me the number of firmware updates the Vespa GTS goes through <clears throat> until I started plugging them into pads. And this goes back to when they changed from the three-prong plug to the four-prong plug back in, like, 2012. 
like I, no. I did the red one the other day. I did a rear tire and a service and I plugged it in and I went, you have a new ECM update. And I went, I have to update this because we saw one bricked. My Ford pickup truck from 2008 has a computer in it. Well, yeah. It has the ability to have updates installed on it. Yeah. Eh, what it doesn't have, it know. doesn't have, it doesn't well, have a radio in it. That's though. right. It doesn't well, have a cellular data. It yeah. That, have a that's where, that's that, when you get fucked. Right? That might when be, it could communicate on its own. That and might you can't be the thing that. though, is that Connectivity. it may actually update OVA. I don't know that older, there, older that there's Dodge even one vehicle now, brand new vehicles. I think almost every one of them is connected. Older, Hence the problem yeah. why they're talking about banning certain Chinese products from coming into the United States. Yeah. yeah. Because the connectivity that those embrace well, when shakes hands with a non-friendly entity. When they and did the way away, they're doing it, the way they're doing it is sneaky because they're going after their FCC God, registrations. Which one? Because that's what they did with the drone market. They're killing the drone market right now because they're not going to grandfather out the ones you own. But any of the new ones, they're going to make it so they can't they can't sell new ones here because they're pulling their FCC license. Well, here's another thing too. When they did away with 3G, because everybody, everybody was like, oh, 5G, it gives brain cancer and bullshit and everything else. 3G was OnStar and a bunch of GPS updates, and Ford was pulling logistics data off your cars from, like, 1997 yeah. and shit like that. So cars have been connected since the 90s. We just don't know it. <laughs> I mean, it's there. It's yeah. part of the thing. Uh, but now it's a control firmware update bullshit thing. But you have it in your Aprilia. Oh, yeah. yeah we you have it. I mean, what year's your Aprilia? 2016. 2016. I, I know it has the chip. Yeah, because yeah, yeah. you have to enter a code and all yeah. kinds of shit. I know it has yeah. a chip. Yeah. And when we think about, like, even very simple motorcycles, and it, it, I was kind of surprised to find, you know, my usual giveaway on that, on a, at least a mo motorcycle in the past 15 years, is if you have a TFT screen. Oh, yeah. So if you have a TFT screen, I can... Almost guarantee there's a sender in there. There's a there's a, a chip inside um, a cell. If it if it's got an Android Android phone for a screen, it's well, right. Yeah. I mean, it's good uh, to go. That's generally a pretty good way yeah. to know that you that you have a vehicle that has that. It's going forward. I believe there's going to be a certain. Uh, I believe people are going to be aware of that, and they're going to start buying things that don't have that connectivity. Well, there, there's been a pushback a past couple of years to go back to flip phones and dumb phones. Yeah, yes. Because people are sick and tired of this bullshit right, right here tracking your eye movement. Now, mm -hmm. granted, I'm addicted to my screen, but, yep. you know, I'm of an age. <laughs> and I also think people want to simplify their life. They yeah. don't want to feel the um, dopamine addiction where they have to look at their phone because everything happens on that phone. So if your phone now goes back to being what the Nokia was when, you know, we all got started, yep. then it's a phone. It, it can, and a defensive aid. Right. Well, and it's, it, <laughs> and it can make phone calls and it can send rudimentary yeah. texts and things and like that. And English snake. Maybe. Yeah. Right. And I do understand why people are going back to that. I think with our motorcycles, I think there's that thing of like, we may have gone too far. Yep. Uh, there's back to carbs. Yep. Oh man. There is no, um there's been a <laughs> and there has been another push now. Though. You want. <laughs> you know what? Yeah. Oh, you know what? I really I really miss my carbs, man. Carbs were great, man. Carbs were awesome. Track me all you want. If that means I, that's what I have to pay to get fuel injection. Yeah, yeah I'm with you. <laughs> I'm one hundred percent with I'll you, pay dude. That price. <laughs> Fuck carburetors. <laughs> <laughs> So Dying wait, so could I have, vehicles. could I have the same, could I have this exact same motorcycle? Yes. But I'd like to have it run really shitty at altitude. Mm. Okay. I'd also like to get it half the miles per gallon it gets right now. Yep. I'd like to reduce the horsepower by about 40%. Check. We can okay. do that. I'd like to fuck with a choke. Hey. We're going to do all those things. I'd like to forget that hey, I have a choke on hey, 30 Phil. minutes from my house. Hey, yeah. Phil, <laughs> we've got special guests. We do have special guests uh, coming in from the theater tonight. We have... Uh, we have Sh Sean Noel and, uh, and Becky's here. <laughs> what the hell do you, are those raffle tickets or just streamers? <laughs> no, they're streamers. <laughs> when they did the big, like, shoot them off Sweet Caroline number, they shot this out of the ground. What did you guys see tonight? It was the Neil Diamond musical. Oh, the Neil Diamond <laughs> experience. The beautiful thing. Beautiful <laughs> noise. Oh, I know when they played Sweet Caroline, the place went apeshit. 
Well, yeah. Yeah. white so people can't control twice. themselves. They can't yeah. control yeah. themselves. Yeah. 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 That's what they said. If there was ever a war, the other army would just go, sweet Caroline. And they'd go, bum, bum, Exactly. Well, they're, where are they? They're hiding in the trenches out right, there. Right. I don't know. Can we ever find them? I don't know. What should we use? We should use uh, drone technology. We should use infrared. Nope. We should use thermal. No. I got a better idea. Sweet Take Caroline. Bum, bum, bum. There they are. We got them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that is that is truly oh, that is the cheat code for dealing with an American. <laughs> We're gonna have a song. We're gonna make him learn all the lyrics. No, 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 just one. <laughs> That's like that Italian song that was just gibberish that was popular back in the sixties. Remember that? Oh, I know the one. What? Yeah, I sent it up. Oh, yeah, 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 Something about balls. I, I don't know what it was. <laughs> yeah. Balls in your mouth. Balls it's in your that's mouth. It. Yeah. Uh, Everybody uh, out there, go look up the Polyfuse Method. The Polyfuse Method. Best is, album is Chris Rock ever put out. The only good Kid Rock. The only good Kid Rock record. Um, the quote for the day is, heaven is where the police are British. The cooks are French. The mechanics are German. The lovers are Italian. And it's all organized by the Swiss. Nice. And I was like, yep. Yeah. Okay. <coughs> that, that. That tracks. I'll go along with it. And, I'll, I'll and, let. I'll allow that. And hell is. And hell is. I didn't. I, what's the other side? Just mix all those up. Just oh yeah. Shift everyone to the Invert, right. Each one, 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 one. Everyone spot to, to the, the right, right one yeah. spot. <laughs> the, pol- the police are German. The police are German. The, the oh no. Are, the the lovers are British. Are British. <laughs> <laughs> or the cooks are British. Oh oh. Yeah. And it's organized by the Italians. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. oh. oh. <laughs> That's not good. That's that's absolutely that's absolutely not good. Hi, Becky. That sounds so. That we're gonna have sound to, awful. We're gonna have to change the name of the podcast. Yeah. The Cleveland Moto uh, Motorcycle News after today's podcast. Well, I mean, this was like very news heavy, right? Yeah, yeah. Well, we don't have a lot of events. No, no. So if we don't have a lot of events, we got to drop back to news. Oh, and, I liked it. I enjoyed yeah. it. But I think, I think people are going to be like, what are these guys? They go, they went straight on us. They're, yeah, they and it's not even interesting enough to be fake news. No. No, it's just kind of just a straight up news. It's yeah. regular old news. It's just a regular old news. No, it was good. It was good stuff. I, would, I enjoyed. We've, we've come to that point in every Clevelander's life where we're not really ready to embrace the suck of winter yet. No. Where we're like, no, I think we got another month. No. But the point yeah. is we know that we don't. No, it's At sneaking up quick. <laughs> We're, we're, we're what, it, we're what, about two weeks away from you having another uh, spray party? Oh, man. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah. The fluid film party's already being put on the schedule. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, the fluid film party has to happen. It's a really, I mean, that is the toughest thing for us when we have to kind of go, huh, it's But yeah, because Sean, Sean's pointing at himself going, yeah, you know, my new Honda has to have all Yeah, his Honda, that. absolutely. <laughs> brand new. We cannot let a brand new Honda oh, see no, salt. No. My, hey. my Honda that came out of New Orleans that has never seen, like, remotely salt. Yeah. Did, we, like, did we look into, after the Diddy bust, weren't they trying to liquidate a bunch of <laughs> lube? We could have got it on sale. <laughs> <laughs> we missed the opportunity for 500 gallons of free lube. Yeah. A thousand oh. bottles of baby. That's a, that's a party. <laughs> Come on, we we cannot fluid film till we shoot clay birds. No, that's true too. Oh, oh right. Yeah. Oh shit. Yeah. Yeah. We do have a sequence. I've still got. Uh, we do still, have a sequence. I've still got shot to run. Yeah, yeah, but we have the election coming up. I kind of want to save my rounds. <laughs> 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 Not to get political. Don't want to burn up any shells you might need in about two weeks. Yeah, right. <laughs> Not to get political or nothing. Okay, but. good point. Good point. Shoot nanny after yeah, November fifth, yeah, right? Yeah, we'll go one week <laughs> after. Right. Go one week after. Because oh. you know what, though, depending on how that goes, yeah, a box of shells could be real expensive. Yeah, <laughs> you may want to buy now. Yeah, uh, yeah. Go hard now. <laughs> Cheap. What is that? Yeah. Cheaper than they don't go bad. <laughs> yeah, they don't go bad. Yeah. They don't go bad. <laughs> Yeah, they don't go bad. I've I've proven they don't go bad. Right. The uh, although Mechel Fresh and those guys, you brought out some shells that were 
Ex- they were like that shit Road Warrior was using. Some of that shit my dad bought from the Johnstown Flood. <laughs> wow. <laughs> so was, wow. You, you, ever, you remember the Johnstown Flood? Absolutely. Oh, yes. this, there this. was the Johnstown Flood, and apparently some people had been looting down there, and he hooked into some ammo that had some been... Some looted ammo? Yeah. All I this. know is that John pulled out some black shells that didn't really have markings, and when he shot it, it almost took his arm and three other people's arms off. I, again. <laughs> oh, Yeah. You don't know what you're getting. This, yeah. uh, you have no idea what you're getting. This this portion of our, portion of our <laughs> broadcast bought to you by cheaper than dirt. Oh, no, I. You know what? I try. Okay, <laughs> well, used, it was turkey load. You had those yeah. super high brass oh, yeah. turkey high brass. loads. I mean, like yeah. holy fuck. Oh yeah, yeah, no, those were BBs. Those weren't even pellets. You could kill a turkey at a hundred yards <laughs> or some of that shit again and fry it. <laughs> <laughs> Don't want to be on the receiving end. No, no. Um, I we didn't enjoy say, being on the shooting end of that. Shit. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And if you guys are podcast listeners and you know of a better hookup, uh, I'm pretty serious. I'm I I troll the Sportsman's Guide real hard. I troll cheaper than dirt. Yeah, real hard. Last year, I came up with a synopsis that if you want to buy number six or number seven shot for shooting clay birds, there is no better place than fucking Walmart. That Walmart was legit buck a box cheaper. Maybe than Royal <laughs> King. Yeah, well, I, yeah, I, I, I got to give them a look. Give them a look. Nine right? bucks. Nine bucks for a box. There you go. Well, uh, game on, boys. Yeah. Right? Yeah, if you like shooting them, you got to buy them first. Well, the funny, the, uh, the funniest part was me going to Cabela's and buying it. That day where we're headed uh, out, and I'm like, uh, I don't know where to buy shells in Cleveland. And I went yeah. to Cabela's. Yeah. And then I dropped the box, and it spilled all over the <laughs> They're like shells all over the front. You counter. tommed like, it. God damn it. <laughs> you, yeah. t- you tommed it perfectly. Exactly. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yep. Uh, yep. Uh, uh. Like motherfucker. Yep. Oh, we got to go out and Tim Walls the shit out of this thing. <laughs> uh, that's that's basically what it comes down to yep. is we got to waltz the hell out of it. The uh, I always look forward to it. It's always super fun. My uh, my nephews have all put the put the word out. They've all yeah. been like, so when we going, Uncle Phil? Yeah. Are, we, are we going? It's a going? good time, man. And I'm like, yeah, we're not going just yet. But I think you guys are perfectly right about the election business. You know what we should do? Mm-hmm. We should bring out the tents. Then we could have it. doesn't matter about the weather. We could shoot in any weather with the the, nor- the summit oh, tents. Yeah. Oh, yeah. We could put a couple of them so, up and we could yeah, have, yeah, have a nice yeah. time. We'll bring a heater. I dare say, well, I've got a couple, we got a couple of portable heaters. But, yeah. Oh, yeah. But I don't want to do, I'm going to do this so the podcast listeners can hear. That's me knocking on fucking wood. Because we've been lucky. Yeah. The last yeah. few years that we've done this, the weather has been delightful. I've yep. rode my Africa twin. I know. And, with gun. And and, and Becky <laughs> Becky loves <laughs> Becky loves shooting skeet. Like there that's her go. that's her new favorite thing. We have the we have the toys. We have the people. We have, we have, we have the, the toys. We got all the stuff. Yeah, we do have all the requisite articles for the shooting of the skeets. Yep. Yeah. Uh, I'm a big fan. I'm so happy that we're going. As usual, it's one of our favorite trips of the year. Yeah. We get to do it. It's, it's always a good time. Yeah. And we have the electric uh, bird thrower, yep. which is also nice because, you know, uh, sit there and press so that button. I don't work this weekend. Uh-huh. I don't work next weekend. Uh-huh. I do work the following weekend. Oh. Uh, yeah, I'm... Okay. Um, well, you well, know we got to work around your schedules. Right. You know, we'll right. figure it out. I mean, I'm... I'm that's, that's the hip one arm hip shooter Captain John over here. I mean, yeah. I have this trip without my. I'm brush. I'm yeah, heading. Yeah. I'm heading. This is gonna laugh. I'm headed to Disney World. Disney World, in a week or two. So that makes All complete right. sense. Nobody's surprised by that. Disney World. <laughs> Just got back from Branson. Right. <laughs> Just got right. back from Branson. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> the best traveled scooter mechanic on planet goddamn Earth. I'm mm-hmm. telling you. Mm-hmm. Yep. That's it. That's exactly right. Disney World. That's what it is. Well. All right. Anybody got anything else? No, nope. damn, it was a podcast, bro. Chris, was. Chris, you got a joke? I do not. Where's your jokes? Oh, no joke. Yep. Um, I can't remember which ones I told and which ones I haven't, so I'm not gonna, <laughs> not gonna try to double dip. Don't run the risk of double dipping. Yeah, yeah well. that's, that's okay. <clears throat> it's all right. Um, I think that's it. I think that's all we got for the moment. Yeah. If uh, if you got somebody and you like them, tell them you like them. Yeah. Because, yeah. Uh, tell them you like them now. Yeah. Tell them you like them. Tell yeah. them you like having them around. You I know like what? You, John. you know what? Yeah, I like you. Make it oh, no. weird. Yeah, yeah we love right John. up in that. Just make it entirely no, I mean, I, I weird. Think, I think it felt like a podcast because John was back and Chris. Right. We were missing yeah. a lot of guys over the last. And few John, been, and John know. fell asleep for like two whole minutes. I know, but that so was okay because he was here. His yeah, presence, he I here. felt it. That was nice. That's perfect. Yeah. I, I believe John. in all these things. <laughs> Are you guys rolling out? And Sean's here, of course. Yeah, Sean's here. So, all right, we're back. Sean's My here. folks, remember to please ride fast and take chances. Play us out of here, Michael Fresh. Bum, 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 b